You know that silly string is going All right. Down. Uh, at 7 o'clock, we have our quorum, so we'll call the meeting to order. Um, this is the Tuesday, August 29th, 2023, meeting of the Hopkins and Conservation Commission. And let's jump into the work section items. So we have uh, no documents for review tonight, uh, which is great. Uh, draft minutes for review, April 25th, 2023. The uh, standard meeting minutes, April 25th, 2023, the executive session meeting minutes, and May 16th, 2023, standard meeting minutes. Did everyone get a chance to look at those? Any comments, questions? Can I please get a motion to approve the, those sets of minutes, please? So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I love not having to do the roll call. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> it's so much easier. <laughs> okay, letter of support for uh, the grants. Kim, you want to kind of walk us through this, please? Sure. So um, tonight I'm asking for the commission to decide on uh, supporting two, two um, requests for grant on behalf of the town. So our new sustainability coordinator among other things, is spearheading two grant applications with MAPC Accelerating Climate Resiliency Grants on behalf of the town. The first one is to support the town's climate action plan, and the second one is to support a project for lakeshore landscaping. Uh, a little bit more about that project, it would be a small grant. There's a parcel off of Lakeshore Drive. There's a parcel off Lakeshore Drive owned by the town um, that's currently being maintained kind of as a lawn area that uh, we would like to create a responsible lakeshore landscaping example out of if we get this uh, grant. So I know that the commission's been talking to lake owners about responsible lakeside management, and I think this could be a great you know model property um, if we can get the grant. And we'd be working with the Green Sustainable Committee um, planning and hopefully the Lake Maspinoff Lake group down there as well. So I would just ask the commission to uh, vote to support if you feel appropriate. Yeah, absolutely, Kim. Thank you. And I think the, you know, the Lakeshore model could be something not only for Hopkinton, but for Upton, Upton, Milford, right? Um, so I, I think that'd be kind of a great uh, project for all the surrounding towns around Lake Maspinock. Um, so I'm all for it. Any questions or comments? Great idea. Thumbs up. All right. Uh, can I get a motion to um, give Kim our support for the grants? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion carries. All right. Okay, annual commission appointments for Zach Open Space, Community Preservation, and the Trails Committee. So um, some of these are coming, some of these are here. So Zach needs to be decided tonight, and then the others are coming up shortly in the fall. So um, if the commission wants to have discussions and make decisions tonight, that would be beneficial. Absolutely. So. Uh, Ted, you're on Zach, right? I'm happy to stay there. Okay. So yes. we can have a motion to... I'll arm wrestle someone if they want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make the motion to nominate Ted for... What are we doing? Second. All right. All in favor? All right. All right. Uh, open space, preservation. That's uh, Ed, I believe. Yes. I'll make a motion to nominate Ed for open space. Yes, huh? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that didn't give you a chance, man. Okay. Uh, CPC. Um, that's me. That's Jim, right? Do you want to continue with that, Jim? Yes, please. All right. We're on motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. And the Trails Committee is, I don't think we have an appointment. Yeah, Janine. Right? Oh, yes. I, I can stay on if, oh, okay. if less anybody else wants it. <laughs> okay. I, I make on. a motion to nominate Janine for 
TCMC. Aye, right, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Wow, that was easy. <laughs> okay, and then I'm on the weed committee, um, Kim, so why don't we just ratify that as well, so I'm willing to continue with that. There's a motion. Need a motion for that one? I'll make that motion. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. That's the late Mass Banach weed committee. Um, Can I ask a question before we move on? Yeah. Where, what's the timetable for replacing... Um, Kerry. Do we Kerry. Have Thank you. <laughs> so we have, as far as I know, we have three applicants that have expressed interest. And I think, Kim, it's going to be the next select meeting or the one next after meeting? that. I believe it's going to be the next select board meeting. I can confirm that with okay. Elaine in the next week and let, and let you right. know. But it is something that's been going on behind the scenes. I've been checking the select board agenda, yeah. so I haven't seen it pop up, so I just was curious. Yeah, I think we have a couple of good candidates that um, applied, so it should be good. Put it in mailing. What's not going to be able to replace Carrie, but uh, we'll mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I won't be new person anymore, so yeah. that's that <laughs> <be> nice. <laughs> the salamander costume gets passed along. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, so we got a few more minutes. The uh, Town of Milford Water Department, we have a filing uh, for some dam work, and they uh, submitted a request to waive the filing fee, which is consistent with what we have uh, done in the past. I believe, Kim, is that correct? Yeah, because it's a town department. Yeah, so we can have a motion to approve that request for the week. So we move. The fee. In a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. Um, okay, Mr. Petruz, he's not here. I guess let's jump. It's a little bit early, but um, Wall Street Development's not here. Do we have Toll Brothers? I'm from Toll Brothers. Uh, okay. We have a few minutes. Let's move on to the uh, Toll Brothers Chamberlain Whalen subdivision violation discussion. You want to come up? Where's, where's the best place for me? Uh, you can choose your seat. Sure. Good evening. Hi. All right, uh, Kim, you want to kind of give us an overview? Uh, yep, let me just get caught up here. Ted Merchant, Ted. Toll Brothers. Yep. yep. So as of 7-23-2023, I observed sediment violations. Sediment eroded beyond the limit of uh, the approved limits of work and into wetland resource areas uh, at the Toll Brothers site. Everybody is aware that we've been having these extreme rate events um, late July into basically two weeks ago. Um, so there was a violation in late July. There was another violation on 0808, um, which was a really heavy rain day. I can pull up some photos. So basically, uh, runoff was sheet flowing off of unsecured house lots and into low, low points, typically where foundation drains uh, were discharging into the, the 50 foot no disturb and the erosion controls were getting overwhelmed and, and overtopping with turbid water. Um, Mr. I keep saying this wrong. Merchant? Yes. I keep wanting to say Merchant. Nope. Okay. Mr. Merchant uh, <laughs> did self-report on August 8th, I believe. Um, they have retained LEC Environmental and LEC has provided a mitigation report. And some uh, mitigation has occurred. So uh, Toll Brothers has installed another construction period temporary BMP in one of the locations, which is receiving some of the runoff water and, and diverting it. And in addition, silt fence has been continuously maintained and reinforced with what they're calling a super silt fence. So it's a chain link fence with a silt fence in the back. Um, and they've also done some and some swales. 
However, um, I am a, I was a little bit disappointed to see that the you know violation in late July occurred, and then it occurred again in August. So you know I kind of wished in those two or three weeks that that the state had been buttoned up a little bit more. Uh, Mr. Merchant has also also committed to a protocol of site stabilization, similar to what we saw on trails, where once the the house is constructed, the Get stabilized. Um, so that's kind of kind of where we're at with that. So we have a notice of violation. We have two notices of violation, and um, no, you know, no fines being discussed or enforcement issued to date. Put some photos. Okay, thanks, Kim. If you can bring up the photos. Um, so first off, thank you for self-reporting. We appreciate that. Um, you know, I kind of echo. Kim's comment, you know, happened in July and then it happened again in August. I mean, you guys are told brothers, this isn't your first rodeo. You know, national company, you've been doing this for a while. So, you know, I guess, um, you know, I'm happy to see that <coughs> mitigation measures are being uh, implemented at the site. You know, hopefully, these rain events, you know, they, they are what they are. You know, it's unfortunate, you know, four or five inches in a day or two, um, you know, a lot of developers are having problems um, in Hopkinton as well as other towns, but, um, you know, let me just open it up to comments from the other uh, commission members. Kim, are these the same locations that I saw, I think in July? Yeah, the hot spots are kind of lot 5, 6, lot 12, and lot, it's 26, 25. And then the August violation was one of the same lots, it was in a different location? Yeah. It's generally those hot spots. Yeah, I, th I think yeah. lots 5 and 6 was our most difficult area, and that's where we constructed the temporary sediment basin. Um, we completed it maybe last week. Um, and it held up much better in, in the most recent storm, wasn't the same intensity, um, but certainly where, uh, where we have the most issues. So uh, we think that that measure will drastically help the situation. So I'm not Joe or Kim, but when I walked the site, it looked like the sediment went a long way into the buffer zone. Um, Kim, did you, how far back did you walk and what I would you guess? I would say it went into the wetland. Yeah, yeah, I, I was thinking the same. It was a long way in. Um, so that's what I observed. Uh, I know we're talking about these violations, but I want to bring up that I was always worried about how much of the buffer we were taking up with yard anyway in the past. And as we go forward with future discussions, I want to remember that I said these 40 foot backyards were not meant to be a new standard. It was for this lot, I will agree to a 40 foot backyard, but that was never meant to be the new standard for backyards, regardless of buffer zone incursion. Um, and this is a reason. Um, when we allow that much buffer zone incursion, if we have then a sediment problem, it's that much closer to what we are charged to protect. So, good point. Thanks, Ted. Kim, was, were efforts made after the first event to deal with these problems or? I would say yes, some efforts were made, but I would say they were probably not commensurate with the scope of the project at large. Okay. Thank you. So no violations from the 818 storm? Yes. There were. There, were, there was a violation. Also on 818. Okay. 88 eight or 818? Eight eight. Oh, I'm sorry, 818? Because 818, that was the bad yes. Friday storm, right? Yes. So it held up on for that storm or whatever improvements were made? I'm sorry, there has been so many storms. I know. Yeah, no, I know. That's why I was asking for clarification. Okay. Friday, I think I have my date right, yeah, but maybe last I don't. Friday was the 25th and we had a rain event that day. It okay. held up. The okay. 18th, we had a violation. Okay. And nothing on the 8th. I just invented that date. Nope. The 8th was also that. I mean, okay. the 8th no, was the worst day. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So the 8th, there was a violation? Mm-hmm. And then in July, there was a violation? So 
the 24, 8, 8, 8, 18. So three different events. Okay. And then the 825, no violation. Okay. Okay. Um, I two other questions, if there are yeah. no other commission members. Um, I've never heard of a super salt fence in the couple of years I've been here. Was that invented for this? And it might be something worth remembering for future projects, the super silt fence as a way to place to start. Uh, we, we've used it elsewhere. It's been specified by other commissions yeah. um, elsewhere. Um, we find, yeah, in, in areas that see more concentrated flows, that it, it holds up better. It doesn't get knocked over as easily, though at some volume it mm -hmm. still doesn't hold up. I'm going to um, file that one away. But it, we find it helpful. It's obviously more expensive to install and more difficult to remove, but sometimes worth it. Um, and then my second question is, you mentioned, Kim, and I already forgot the terminology, I think, but immediately um, putting stuff down on the dirt once the construction is complete of a home. What does construction complete mean? Is that the framing? Is that every shingle? Uh, the sooner that, that open space can be covered, the happier I am. Um, can there be a, it can remain uncovered within 20 feet of the home? but everything else should be covered. Do you, does anyone understand my question? If you yeah. clear a, a acre of land for one house, and that happens, do we really have to leave the whole acre uncovered until that house is complete, or is there something else we can do in the future? So, I mean, if, if I may. Anybody. I know, uh, <laughs> I, so I, I sort of answered that in my communication with Kim was, we we think that we need more space as the house gets framed and then the roof gets put on and the shingles put up. Once that is done, we think that we can really consolidate the space that we use. And we mm -hmm. use 15 feet as, as the number. But what I requested of Kim is in 45 days, we think that we can go from foundation being backfilled to shingles being on the house, at which point we can stabilize everything outside of that 15 feet. And stabilization, in that context isn't like loam and seed necessarily it's seed and straw on the barren dirt but we've had success mm -hmm. with germination there. Um, keeping in mind that we will have to dig utility trenches through and decks need to go on things like that so there'll be some disturbance to that zone but in general we'd like to keep it you know within 15 feet of the home after 45 days that, that's the goal and the rest would be then covered with straw and Planting, Jeff, I have a question. Yep. Yes, go ahead. So you're saying leave the site open for 45 days. You don't need all that room. So, so once you pour the foundation, you don't need all that room for, for, uh, for framing. You need a lay down area and you need truck access, right? Yeah. So you you've got to put a driveway, you know, you got to put some temporary driveway in anyway. Why can't you then go around? I mean, you're framing off a scaffolding or something that's... Because well, because we're using a wall to pick up trusses and, um, you know, set the sheathing on the roof. And, and forgive me, I'm, yeah, not okay. the, I'm not the home building <laughs> expert of this. I'm the land development guy. But, um, yeah. you know, I'm told we need, you know, 50 feet plus in order to be able to have that wall back up, lift his boom, extend out. Um, to get to the roof. So that, that's why we set those parameters um, for space. Yeah, all right, I can see that. Um. To the chair? Yes, Kim. The EPA CGP permit requires stabilization in 14 days. <laughs> for, for areas that aren't continuing to be disturbed, right? That is true. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much disturbance is driving the... I mean, to get I, I mean, I'd say if, up. if we seeded and strawed it, it would get disturbed. I, I know that when we, so our, our program in general is to seed, you know, uh, uh, call it pad lots, so get them generally graded, seed them, and then when we come back to build the house, they get disturbed again. So in that interim period, if people are driving on that lot, in that seeded lot, it, it doesn't maintain its yeah. germination. Okay. Jeff again. Yeah. Why can't you just throw some some uh, 
uh, ryegrass, something down to stabilize. So yeah, you're gonna get ruts and all that. It's not, you're not putting loam down, but something to stabilize, even if you're driving over it. I mean, you're not, you're not working when there's a torrential rainstorm and you got mud everywhere, right? I mean, oftentimes they're working like, the next day, right? And that tends to... But you're not gonna get, you, you're gonna be careful not to get equipment stuck, so you're gonna... Wish. Um, <laughs> I, w our experience is that that area gets torn up pretty quickly um, if people are driving on it. Mm. Okay. Um, so I think what I'm hearing is that it's kind of standard practice. That's the way you guys do things. Well, I think the, the stabilization, the interim stabilization, we call it the you know, 15 feet plus, is not our standard practice. I think that's something that we are implementing here based on what we've been seeing over the past month or two. Okay. Um, our, our standard practice is to stabilize lots after we mass grade, and then uh, when the house comes along, we, we don't typically stabilize again until the home is complete, but we're suggesting doing that here. Okay. Okay. Um, so the SWIPs up to date on the site, Kim? You know? Yes. Okay. And LEC has been hired? It's been H HRH. HRP is our, our HRP, yeah. is our weekly inspector, and in this instance where we've had some issues, we've hired LEC to come out and supplement and give us some recommendations. Okay. Um, okay. Through the chair? Yes. Um, while I have you, can I just ask one more related question? Shoot. Uh, Anna and I, in walking the site, did notice that some of the homeowners are mowing and maintaining lawn areas beyond the PIBs. What is Toll Brothers protocol for information at the point of sale? That's an excellent question that I don't know the answer to. Okay. Um, I can get you that, okay. but, I, but I don't know. Okay. I know that they're notified, but how? I'll find out. Okay. So, um, Kim, if I can ask you a question. So what is, like, what is there that they're mowing? Was there grass inadvertently sprayed there? That's a good question. Because I like, you know, I would think if I saw grass there, I would mow it. So they accidentally so putting grass. I, I think where I can they're not supposed to. Oh, okay. So the, the how the NOI was initially uh, approved was that there was grading that needed to go beyond where the PIBs were in order to get the lot, mm -hmm. you know, to the elevation that they needed to be. We then set the PIBs in from the clearing limit line. So there is grass on the opposite side of the PIPs, and I'm, I'm assuming that's what that's they're exactly maintaining. What okay. Thank you. To, to the chair, this is Ed. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm so used to doing this on TV. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, this particular thing is in, uh, I represent the open space, and this open space turf going to be interspersed around there. And this is an issue with open space where people don't know where the boundaries are and they start clearing and doing things on open space, what's going to be open space property. And it's, it's again about the builder making it clear to the homeowner, you know, put something in the ground so that you don't go past here. Yeah, I believe the protocol and, and even requirement on the subdivision plan, I think, is to set lot pins at all corners of the lot. So it, it should be that, that, able to be seen, but whether there, the needs, there, there needs to be more markers on the boundary. I, I will say uh, these were very clearly marked. The, these PIBs are very clearly installed and marked. Very clear. <laughs> <laughs> Just the educational component, yeah. I think, yeah. with, which is the missing link. Um, okay. All right. Um, so good discussion. I'm going to move along here. Kim, can we, I mean, in light of the fact that with three separate occasions with the violations, I think it probably makes sense to kind of ratify the um, violation and compute what the fines are, and then we can talk about that um, at the next meeting. You know. By ratify, do you mean enforcement? Or? Yes, okay. please, yeah. 
So I will drop the enforcement order to memorialize LEC's commitments that were already made in the uh, report given to me, and then your commitments via email for stabilization. So that makes sense, everyone? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And these, we haven't had any issues or fine issues to date on this project, right? I don't think we've had any issues. We did have a previous violation with the previous developer uh, when the original roadway was going in, but that was the last, I think it was 2021, and that was the last time with the previous developer. Yeah, yeah that was with Mr. Mastriani. Yeah. Okay. That was one incident, right, Kim? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Right. Thank you. All right. Um, so moving along to our new hearings. Uh, Hara Heron, 234 Hayden Road. This is a notice of intent filing for after the fact landscaping. Um, yep, come on up, sir. The Hopkins and Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, August 29th, 2023, at the Hopkins and Senior Center. 28 Mayhew Street to hear all persons interested in notice of intent for after the fact landscaping at 234 Hayden Row. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Okay. Um, Joe, do you want to give us an overview of your findings when you uh, did a site sure. inspection? I was out on uh, August 16th. Uh, to take a look at the site uh, and, the, and the recent activities. Um, uh, I did note that there were some uh, recent plantings. Uh, I counted uh, five red maples, sweet, uh, three sweet pepper bush, and one red chokeberry um, that were planted uh, within the disturbed area. Uh, as far as a disturbance, uh, the area that's on the plan that's uh, shown in yellow, uh, contains trees that uh, had previously been approved for um, being removed. Um, that, that I think there were 13 trees that had been approved for removal uh, as hazard trees. Um, and apparently subsequent to that, uh, the remainder of the area uh, was cleared in addition to clearing uh, quite a bit of oriental bittersweet. Um, and then subsequent to that, there was uh, filter fabric placed over the area and several inches of, of wood chips placed on top of the, the filter fabric. Um, the, uh, although it's uh, not uh, wetland, the, the buffer zone is quite wet. It's uh, pretty close to being wetland. Um, I did observe upland soils uh, you know, between the disturbed area and the, the delineated wetland line, uh, but there are some pockets of, of hydric soil uh, within the buffer zone. The area was previously forested, uh, primarily with red maple and white ash with some scattered shrubs and small white pines. Um, and also, as I mentioned, a dense growth of oriental bittersweet uh, growing up many of the trees. I noted, um, again, uh, as stated in the, the Hopkinton uh, wetland bylaw, um, the bylaws to, uh, first of the bylaws to protect the wetlands related water resources and adjoining land areas in the town of Hopkinton by controlling activities deemed by the Conservation Commission likely to have a significant adverse effect, immediate or, cum or cumulative, upon wetland values, including but not limited to the following protection of public or private water supply, protection of groundwater, flood control, erosion and sediment control, storm damage prevention prevention of water pollution, fisheries, wildlife, wildlife habitat, rare species habitat, including rare plant species, and recreational values. Uh, as was stated in the findings of fact under the order of conditions that was issued, the buffer zone at the site contributed to protection of erosion and sediment control, prevention of pollution, protection of public and private water supply, protection of groundwater supply, flood control, storm damage prevention, wildlife habitat, and wildlife. The disturbed area uh, uh, extends to uh, about 32 feet from the 
edge of the uh, approved BBW delineation uh, within the 50 foot no disturbance zone. And there's approximately 600 feet uh, of disturbance uh, based on what was uh, submitted in the application. And again, as stated under your bylaw, uh, the applicant carries the burden of proof for demonstrating to the commission satisfaction that the proposed work or activities in the buffer zone are necessary and that reasonable alternatives, including reducing the scale and scope of the project, do not exist. Uh, there was no description of the potential impacts to the protected interests of the uh, uh, act and bylaw uh, within the filing nor was there a description of how the proposed activity met the performance standards of the act and the bylaw. Uh, and recommend that that information needs to be provided by the applicant. Uh, also, it was noted uh, that um, although snakes were apparently uh, observed by the applicant um, at the house, uh, would not consider these to constitute uh, a health threat as described in the application, uh, as there are no poisonous snakes present in this part of the state. A couple of minor issues uh, on WPA Form 3, the filing fee information was missing and the uh, fee transmittal form uh, check information was missing. Uh, erosion controls are present, uh, are, I'm sorry, erosion controls are not present. However, uh, site is quite level, there is no evidence of any uh, uh, erosion or any significant uh, soil disturbance. Uh, DEP has issued a file number for the site with the comment that erosion control should be installed. And that's the end of my comments. Okay, thank you, Joe. Okay. Um, so, I think we have discussed in the past um, with you, sir, kind of the history of this project. So the project was originally proposed to the commission in the 2020-2021 time frame. Uh, the developer at the time in 2020 submitted a plan to us and that plan was denied um, by the commission. Subsequent to that, and, and the reason for that was because it was a significant size house and there was significant incursion into the buffer zone. Um, the applicant subsequently submitted to the commission a request for reconsideration, which was also denied. Um, after the request for reconsideration was submitted, the applicant filed a new notice of intent with a smaller footprint for the house and less incursion into the buffer zone. There was a lot of kind of reticence on the commission standpoint at the time about approving that because of this very situation. Um, you know, we brought up with the developer, this is a fairly large structure, you know, on a small lot. There's essentially no backyard. Um, so the issues were, uh, the concerns were raised by the commission that when a future homeowner comes in and they only have 10 feet of lawn behind the house, um, you know, that can be problematic. The developer decided that he wanted to go forward with the application as was, um, as was drawn up here, as designed. And again, we reluctantly uh, approved it. So here we are two years later um, in the same situation that we were concerned about, you being the new homeowner, you know, wants to expand the yard. And we made it very clear with the developer that uh, when we approved the project in 2023 that there was not going to be any additional lawn expansion or incursion into the buffer zone um, allowed as part of the approval process that was written into the order of conditions. So, um, you know, here we are. It's, you know, I, I feel really bad 
about this um, because I understand your position. You don't have a, a yard. You know, you would like to expand it. Uh, that's again being misconstrued. Uh, no. no it, oh, oh, hold on. It's, nothing's being misconstrued. Those were the facts of the project. Okay. Those, those were the facts. There's nothing misconstrued, Kim. Um, so there's nothing misconstrued, sir. Those were, there was an order of conditions that was issued for this project. These issues were brought up with the developer at the time the project was approved, okay? So you're welcome to review the project file, but there's no, nothing that's misconstrued. Um, you, you're welcome to, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sh shutting you down. You can, you're welcome to express your opinion, but I'm just telling you these are the facts of the project. So go ahead, you can speak. So, I mean, the reasons for putting this much, it's, it's, not, it's not something to expand the yard or something. It's just to co in stop these dense vegetation and often poison ivy and the snakes that I encountered. You, you can see on the backside how dense the vegetation grows if you don't control it. And yeah. it'll just kind of creep in uh, to the house in no time. So that's, that's, that's a big challenge. Um, there's, there's no no other kind of reason for me to put such like ugly mulch there um, on this area. No, I I, I, I understand. Um, and you know I can take all steps to kind of revegetate on the front side sides. I've already started putting maple trees on um, and shrubs. So I the, you know the commission has no problem with you managing the, ve the vegetation up to the extent of the lawn area, which was what was approved as part of the project. The area where you've put the, the mulch and the landscaping barrier below the mulch is in the buffer zone. That's the, you know, that's the issue. So I understand it is vegetation, but it's buffer zone that was as part of the project approval was supposed to remain undisturbed. No mulch, no barrier. You know, if the vegetation was creeping into the lawn area, for sure, you know, you would be allowed to manage that. But this is something that the commission, um, you know, can't allow, unfortunately. And I'm gonna be quiet and open it up to the other commission members. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much it in a nutshell, but I guess the only thing I would add is that that, that area in the buffer zone is supposed to be habitat. Um, you know, that's part of the resource that we're, we're protecting and, and what we want the buffer zone to be. And there's no habitat there um, for wildlife um, Which or anything. snakes. Snakes are a part of the wildlife habitat. Correct. So, um, I'm going to also throw in the applicant is asking for, if my count is correct, a compromise on a compromise on a compromise. I think this would be a fourth time we'd be asked to compromise if we were to approve this. Starting with no house, then okay, we'll compromise with a smaller house. Okay, we'll compromise with clearing some trees. Okay, we'll compromise. He's now asking for this. It, this would not be a first. Can't you guys just work with me for us? Through the chair. Yes, sir. In fact, parcel, part of this parcel, this buffer zone, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that has invasives in it, which are the things that really like to creep out. Is it within his purview and our wish to have things like bittersweet actively removed? That was, um, so the last request from the applicant was to come in and remove some of the invasives and cut down some of the, uh, you know, dead or dying trees right. that pose a risk to the, to the property and to manage some of the invasives. 
Well, I'm talking. I'm talking the back part, you know, beyond this area right here, which has got. I'm trying to remember buckthorn, bittersweet, um, and other things that are very definitely invasive. Um, and it would seem like the question would be making sure that that's all that came out. Um, that's kind of a separate issue, though, Ed, from okay. what we're discussing right now. Okay. Um, you know, I think if the applicant is willing to do that um, and to address the invasives, that's something the commission can consider. But, you know, what we're talking about right now is just the incursion here from the 50 foot buffer zone to 32 feet. Um, and, you know, to Ted's point, you know, we've compromised several times here. Um, you know, I'll also add that the resource area is an um, outstanding resource uh, water for the DEP within a public water supply um, watershed, and it's also a Zone B uh, surface water supply protection area with the DEP. So, you know, it's a fairly significant resource area um, that, that we're protecting. So, I have a question. Uh, yes, Jim. So, on the uh, diagram I'm looking at, um, where the large uh, letters red maple, there's, there's two dimensions here. One says 18 feet, it's in the block, 18 feet from the 50 foot buffer zone. And then on the left side, it says 25 feet. What's the 18 feet exactly? It certainly isn't that bold red arrow, right? Where's the 18 feet? And then where's the 32 feet? So, through the chair? Yes, Jim. Mike. So this particular sketch has been edited a few times by both myself and the applicant. Um, so that's probably not accurate? So the scale? Right, so what we do know, based on Joe going out and pulling a tape measure, is that the corner of the disturbed area at its closest point to the flagged wetland was 32 feet. Let me clarify. Right. I'm basing okay. that on the plan and not a tape measure pull. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I would estimate it was probably in the in the 30 foot range just visually. Yeah. Boundary line. And yeah. I had done a quick math that it was about 600 square feet of proposed disturbance to the 50 foot no disturb. Would you say that that's roughly? Yeah. Yeah. About 600 square feet. And when, we, and when he came in, we asked for the M1 marking, he couldn't find it. So, and he said it's going back behind. The what marking? The M1 wetland well, marking. M1. I couldn't yeah. find the flag M1. So he said it's going back. So definitely that site plan which shows M1, it's, the wetland doesn't, it's not horizontal, it's going back. So it's, the closest point is 32 feet, but it's, it's, it's going back much further. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any other questions, comments from the commission? Questions, comments from the audience? Um, all right, Mr. Har Heron, unfortunately, you know, I don't think this is a project that can be approved, um, but we'll take a vote on it in a second. Um, Again, for the reasons stated, you know, I, I, I feel bad having to tell you this, and I think the other commission members do as well, but, you know, this was less than two years ago that, you know, we told the developer that these issues were going to come up, but he wanted to move forward with the project as it was, and the order of conditions was issued, you know, based on the structure that was built, um, which had a very limited uh, area in the yard. Unfortunately, so um, I mean, uh, can I can I just make some comments? Uh, sure, uh, quickly. But yes, go ahead. Okay. So, f f first of all, is this kind of the um, the buffer zone rules just applies to me and not the neighboring lots? It applies to this particular project in general. So, but yes. how come the neighboring lots are not enforced the same same rule as me? The neighboring lots um, were approved. So there's been, I think, a 10-year period where these lots have been approved by the developer. 
Um, so the bylaw has changed over those 10 years. Um, and also we look at cumulative impacts, okay? So when we look at a subdivision development, which is this, this is considered, I think there were seven or eight homes that were okay. uh, approved as part of the subdivision. We look at cumulative impacts. So, um, you know, one project may have more impacts, which are approved, which means that in then the other project has to bear that correct how come this i'm bearing that uh, because you were the last ho house that was approved as part of the that's not kind of a way to, to kind of handle that it has to be equally managed by every 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 lot owner right uh no if you look even at the pictures even okay so i'm not going to argue with you okay that's I'm, one point. i'm explaining what okay. the process is it's fortunate that the developer was allowed to put a house on this lot in the first place. As I said, it was denied. A request for reconsideration was submitted. That was denied. So he came in with another proposal with a smaller footprint. And as I said, you know, and I'm not going to keep repeating myself, the commission was very reticent about approving that, but we did and we raised the concerns that you're bringing up tonight. You know, very small yard. You know, we told the developer, we think you should make the house smaller so there's more yard. No, I don't want to do that, because then I can't sell the house at the market rate. I, so I'm just telling you, okay, you can, you can disagree and you can be, yeah. um, you know, upset about, you know, how the process went, but that's how the process went. And unfortunately, you know, an order of conditions was written up um, in 2023, uh, or, or 2021, excuse me, um, which set the limits that you as a new homeowner has to live with, unfortunately. Um, so we can't, as a commission, approve something, and then two years later, when someone doesn't like it, the new homeowner come in and, you know, change our, modify the, you know, what was approved, um, you know, because a, a homeowner is not happy with the, the limits that they have on, on their property, and unfortunately, sir, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, so, again, you know, I feel really bad that you're in this situation, um, but... And then if your aim is to just protect the buffer zone, right? Correct. So, it's the same for everybody, not just unique for me, right? Whether it's 10 years ago or now, is that correct? Um, well, yeah, the yeah. the charge is to protect, protect the, the buffer, buffer zone, right? So it's just but the regulations change. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Over right. over time. Yeah. So fast forward 2023, just for opposite to my lot, zero head and grow. Ron Nation, the builder, built a asphalt road through the vegetated buffer land. You let him build that. Mm -hmm. How come that's possible? Um, there was a significant amount of land that was set aside as open space. There was a crossing on that particular project. We're not going to get into the details, but there was mitigation. Uh, so a makeshift buffer land was made, is that right? You're there was replication. Replication. Yeah. You saw that area? There's not even a firm. It's, it's well, no firm. It's not done yet, sir. But I'm, that's neither here nor there. We're talking about this so project. It's, if it's, I'm sorry I had to bring, bring this up publicly, but this is if we are, your aim is to protect the buffer zone. It's the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no kind of nepotism or excuse or favoritism against one versus another, whether it's Ron Nation, the builder, or me, or the neighboring lot. Correct. Yes? Yep. So, how come he built an asphalt road through the bu buffer zone, through the vegetated land, he, and here there's just much, not even impervious area? I, I just explained to you why. I mean, so this is I, kind uh, of, I, 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 I'm sorry I had to bring this up, but yeah. this is, is in, a, in a public forum, but um, this is something that... Yeah, can I put something out? Sure. Give me a permit that we're discussing about the lot that you own, is a permit that was issued before construction, for the construction of that property. The permit that was issued for the property across the road there <clears throat> was issued before construction and based on the construction. 
There's many things that are taken into consideration. The size of that property across the street is substantially larger than yours. You're dealing with a very small area. It doesn't matter, it could have been anybody that came into your lot to get the same thing. It would be the same, you weren't the developer, you weren't the builder. Any builder, doesn't matter what their name is, that came in to develop that lot, they would have gotten the same thing from us as the developer of the lot that you bought it from. No, but I'm asking so if not. the buffer zone protection mm -hmm. laws are the same for everybody. Everybody that is has absolutely to correct. So, so let me just explain one point and then we're moving on. Yeah. Okay. So with the subdivision across the street, Mr. Nations, Connolly Farms. Same, same the, person who sold the lot. speak, sir? Yeah. Sure. Okay, thank you. So I forget how many houses were approved. There were eight or nine homes approved as part of that development. Okay, and each of those individual lots has limitations similar to this. Okay, there's a permanent immovable barrier that's established at those locations. Okay, so when a new homeowner comes in and buys those lots, okay, once the houses are built and the developers moved on and this homeowner's there, that person who has a home who owns the home can't come before us and say, I'd like to expand my lawn beyond the PIB. So that's a similar situation here that you're dealing with where they will come before us and we would say, unfortunately, no, we can't allow that. As part of the approval of the development, these PIBs were established for each of these individual homes. So unfortunately, yes, we understand you like to put a pool in. No, no, or, no. No, I'm just, this is a hypothetical, right? I want to expand my lawn beyond the PIB, or I want to put a pool in or a shed. Beyond the, we, you know, the answer would be the same to those Absolutely. individuals. No, we, we can't No, I kind it. of, I completely agree with you in, the, in, so, that, in that part. But here, I'm not asking about putting extra pool, but recreation you're, you're, facility. You're trying to expand beyond the PIB that was established for the property. And for the reason of the basically, it's, snakes and veg de poisonous vegetation that was, you, you, you could have, you, I wish I can show. Yes, Kim. Um, if the commission decides on, on a denial tonight, what would be the next steps for Mr. Harris? That was my question. Mm -hmm. So the next steps would be, um, so there's uh, an enforcement order that's in place, right? There's no enforcement the order. So um, I explained to Mr. Harahan that that it would likely either be um, a notice of intent, you know, uh, to request that the commission allow the work, or the commission may go towards enforcement. Right. So, um, correct. So there wasn't an enforcement uh, issued for this. So that would, the enforcement would need to be put in place, Kim, and ratified, and we would require Mr. Harris, um, Mr. Harran, to, you know pull the block mulch and the landscape fabric back to the 50 foot no disturb zone, uh, which was at the end of the lawn area. Okay, so we gotta move on here. Um, so is there a motion to deny the notice of intent? Sorry, through the oh, oh, yeah, hold on a second. Would you like to bifurcate the vote? Yeah, so we'll bifurcate it under the Wetland Protection Act and the bylaw, because um, this is something that could be approved under the act, but not the bylaw because the bylaw is stricter. So under the Wetland Protection Act, um, is there a motion to approve the project? I will make a motion to approve. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. 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 There was a motion to approve. Under motion the act. Motion to approve under the act. Under the I'm act. I'm saying nay. Okay. All right, hold on, because I didn't. How many people just said no? Yeah, the motion doesn't pass. Okay. So, uh, under the bylaw, is there a motion to uh, deny the project? So moved. moved. And a second. second. I'll take the second. And this is a denial. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Okay, so, um, Kim, if we can put uh, an enforcement order in place to remove the mulch and the landscape uh, barrier, um, if we can have that ratified for the next meeting. Okay. okay. Through the chair? Uh, yes. Um, just looking at this, I think the last time we discussed this before the application, it was also to pull the PIB all the way to the 100 foot buffer on the north side of the property so it got to that existing propane tank. 
that was part of our discussion before, is to go along, yeah. right? So for the enforcement order, I would love for that to be reflected as well. Okay, good point. All right, thank you, Ted. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and, you know, again, I'm sorry that you're in this situation. Uh, yeah, but I um, I still feel that it's a one-sided one view. Okay. All right, uh, zero Echo Lake. This is a request for determination of applicability for a dam improvements. Hopkins and Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, August 29th, 2023, at 7 o'clock p.m. to hear all at the Hopkins and Senior Center to hear all persons interested in a request for determination of applicability for dam improvements. The location is zero Echo Lake. Overview of what you guys want to do. Uh, sure. Yeah, my name is Dave Kawa. I'm a managing engineer with Park Corporation. This is Lauren Gluck. She's a senior environmental scientist with Park. We're here on behalf of the Milford Water Department to uh, for a request for determination for some dam improvements uh, at the Echo Lake Dam. Uh, some of the issues that have come up over the last several phase one inspections, which are dam safety inspections that are required by the Office of Dam Safety. Uh, some questions about the, uh, the stability factor of safety on the dam, uh, the ability for the dam to pass the spillway design flood storm event, um, and some issues that the uh, Milford Water Department has brought up are public access and trespassing uh, on the dam itself, worker access to the top of the dam, and inadequate uh, spillway controls on the structure. Uh, so basically we did a, uh, in 2017, we did a stability assessment on the dam and found that it didn't meet all the factors of safety. We redid that assessment in 2019, considering what the arch configuration of the dam. We basically found that the original dam that was built in uh, the mid 1800s was stable in 1902. They added on a 10 foot section above it and there's some questions about the ability um, of the dam to remain stable during extreme loading events. Basically what we're uh, suggesting to do with, uh, to deal with that is drill holes through the top of the dam and basically put in some pins, uh, steel thread bar pins um, through the top of the dam. Uh, on the downstream side, uh, so the, the Charles River side, uh, with the, um, <coughs> The spillway design flood capacity, so this dam structure is required by the Office of Dam Safety to pass the one-half probable maximum flood event. Um, under the hydraulic model scenarios, that would overtop this dam and the, uh, the, uh, the flash boards on top of the dam by about uh, two feet. Um, so the dam itself with the arch configuration, the stone masonry, it can stand up to that, uh, that loading. Uh, but what the Milford Water Department's concerns are and, and valid concerns are the scour that would occur on the downstream side uh, were two feet of water to come over the top of this. Uh, it's about 1,200 CFS, I think, is, is what it equates to. Um, so we're proposing that we excavate out at the bottom of the dam and install riprap scour protection uh, along the bottom of the dam to basically uh, prevent that scour from happening. Um, as I said, it's not necessarily threatening the stability of the dam, but the, the five feet of scour that's expected from that flow would release significant sediments and also threaten the uh, the ability of the dam's function to remain as a water water supply structure for the town of Milford. Um, so putting in that that stone riprap at the bottom is is our solution to that approach. Um, the town also has issues with public accessing the top of the dam for fishing. Uh, so we're proposing to put up some fencing around the perimeter of the site to uh, limit the the public's access to the the dam structure itself. Mm -hmm. um, on top of the dam, uh, there's a little bit of leakage that comes through the, the, the boards on the top. In the winter, that freezes over and it makes accessing the top of the dam pretty dangerous for the workers. So we're proposing a, a steel grating platform that is basically anchored into the top of the dam to raise the, the, the walking surface above where the water's collecting. 
um, and then at the spillway itself, the uh, the spillway control system there is, is uh, slightly outdated right now. It's a flashboard system uh, with corroding steel, and we basically want to uh, remove all that corroding steel, install new steel stanchions and new stop logs that are more uh, easily operated by, by the town. What's involved in that part of the project? On the spillway? Yeah. So it would be uh, going in and basically cutting flush. All the, the steel stanchions right now come out of the stone masonry crest. So we basically cut those flush, uh, saw cut around so we can um, we can lay the new steel stanchions flush with the, the stone surface and then drilling and grouting anchors into place. How deep would the anchors be drilled? Uh, I think it's uh, 10 inches, 10 or 12 inches. No, 10 inches. Okay. Yeah. Into the existing stone basin. Um, and then the anchors in the upper part of the dam to stabilize that, how deep do those the go? Dam, like up over yeah. along the crest, those are going uh, 20 feet into the dam. Okay. And that's all within the stone masonry. Yep. Uh, um, that's about a, a six inch diameter hole that would be cored in there. Okay. So the more intrusive components of the project are the anchors up top, the removal of the base of the dam, yep. um, and then the replacement of the stanions. Yeah, so uh, I think the most intrusive that, that gets into the resource areas are um, all the work o along the crest of the dam and those anchors are, that's, that will all stay within the footprint. Um, the downstream excavation of the soils to install the riprap is going to be, uh, it's going to generate a lot of soil. That's all in here? That's all in there, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the work up here is the, the anchor holes are only going to be uh, about an inch diameter and that's yeah, drilling in so it will generate like a, uh, I guess a stone dust slurry um, that okay. we would be able to. All right, great, thank you. Uh, Joe, did you have comments? Yeah, a few comments. Um, I was on the site uh, August 16th, uh, reviewed the wetland flags and uh, just did a general uh, inspection. I uh, was uh, in general agreement with, with the, uh, the wetland flagging. There were a couple of missing flags, but based on the flags that were present, I didn't have uh, any issues with the line. Um, uh, just know that one flag I thought was actually a little bit high, uh, flag uh, R5, um, but that doesn't, it's about five feet high, not, not very much. I did uh, note that there's a fringe of VVW, um, uh, on the upstream side of the dam, uh, eastern end, uh, I point roughly, roughly in this area right here that was not delineated. Um, so I recommended that uh, the applicant provide some uh, description of any work that is going on in that area that might impact uh, that BBW. Um, as far as the uh, exemptions uh, that the applicant is uh, looking for. Uh, we agree that the uh, work is exempt under uh, 310 CMR 10.02A2 for uh, uh, activities conducted to maintain, repair, or replace, but not substantially change or enlarge an existing and lawfully located structure or facility used in the service of the public and used to provide uh, electric, gas, water, sewer, telephone, telegraph, or other communication services. Uh, we believe that applies to, to, the, to the, uh, all the work on the site. There was another exemption mentioned in the application regarding uh, work in the riverfront area, which uh, we don't feel applies because um, that only applies if uh, work is not proposed in any other resource area. Um, unless it's a minor project. Um, 
a minor activity. Uh, so maybe the fence would uh, apply under that uh, uh, exemption, but not the rest of the work. However, overall, I think the, the work would be uh, considered exempt under the Wetlands Protection Act and under the, the, uh, the bylaw regulations. Okay. Do you have concern about equipment access to the site? Uh, I did note, um, yeah, that uh, went a different description of uh, access to the site um, uh, from uh, the roadway, whether or not any maintenance or improvements would need to be done on the access road, because uh, there are some BBWs um, right along the edge of that access road mm. uh, in close proximity. Um, so maybe some information on that. Uh, as far as uh, there's a FEMA 100 your uh, flood zone mapped uh, in the, the lake above the dam. Uh, it's a zone A uh, with uh, no elevation provided, but it's not shown on the site plan. I recommend that uh, that be indicated on the site plan. Uh, also noted that the, uh, the plans that I had reviewed were not stamped by a professional engineer. Uh, recommend that those be stamped. And, yeah, I think that pretty much covers the uh, comments I had. Okay, thank you, Joe. Yeah. Comments, questions from commission members? Yes, I have a question. Where yes. is the access road? Is it out the 85 to Columbia South? Yes. Yep. Right? And it's not really that improved right now? Uh, there, so there was uh, some work that was done in 2019 due to a ice loading event late in the, the spring season that pretty much bent all of the existing stanchions on top of the dam um, and they had to go in and, and remove those stanchions and install new stanchions um, at that time there were improvements done to that access road where there was some uh, crushed stone placed uh, down in, in wet areas um, since I've been going down there uh, it's it's been pretty stable. We had last summer we had a drilling contractor on site to do a test hole through the top of the dam, a test core through the top of the dam, and they had no issues accessing the. Oh, okay. the site. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all gravel, right? So. Yeah, it's, it's a maintained it's a access base. road it's by the whatever. town for their. Uh, they they go forever. out there frequently for their water supply operations. All right, thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair, I have uh, one yes. question. I thought I heard you say excavate under the dam for the riprap. You don't mean to physically go under the dam. Sorry, you below the current uh, ground surface there, we be we wouldn't be disturbing yeah. the stone okay. mystery at just, all. Just checking. <laughs> Okay, so I think there's a few kind of loose ends that need to be buttoned up. You know, if we can get the plan stamped, the FEMA flood zone mapped out. Um, sounds like the uh, access isn't going to be an issue. Um, maybe we can just get an email to that effect, Kim, for the project record. Um, I think that should do it. So Couple, couple things. Okay. Um, but it looks pretty straightforward, and I don't foresee any uh, issues. Uh, you know, once that information's been taken care of. So, okay. Yeah. Great. Can I get a motion to continue this out to September 12th, please? Sure. Yeah. Yes, Kim. Public comments. Yep. Were there any comments from the public? Okay. Uh, continuation to September 12th. Is there a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, moving along to. Thank you. Continued hearings, this is the town of Hawkington, uh, 129, 147, Hayden Row, Lot C, Myrtle Ave, Lot B, Fitch Ave, an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation. Good evening. Hello. 
Mark Manganello with LEC Environmental. Hey, Mark. Give us a quick update. Sure. So, the commission hired Lucas Environmental to peer review this ANRAD, which was presented to you initially back in July. Um, there was an initial peer review letter from Joe with some comments on the delineation. Um, Claire Hogeboom from LEC, who I'm sitting in for tonight, couldn't be here, met with Joe in the field. Uh, they agreed to revisions. The plan's been updated to reflect those revisions, and I believe Joe is in agreement with the delineation at this point. So I think we've got everything covered. Um, I can go through the revisions in detail if you'd like, or perhaps uh, Joe will be doing that anyhow. Yeah, Joe, do you just want to give us a quick... Uh, yeah, I'll give you just a quick... Uh, I did, like you mentioned, meet there with Claire out in the field. We reviewed all the uh, uh, areas which I had uh, mentioned in our review. Um, agreed on revised uh, flag locations. And in one case, that was somewhat uh, downgradient of what was flagged, and in another case, it was upgrading of what was flagged. Uh, uh, but as of this point... Uh, all the comments uh, that we had submitted have been adequately addressed, and the site plan has been uh, updated to show the uh, revised flag locations. Okay, there was one area where it wasn't clear whether it was an IVW or BVW. That's correct, yeah. The, the wetland extends off-site, so we were unable to confirm whether or not it borders on anything because mm -hmm. um, we don't have access to delineate on the private property. So we suggested that the commission, when you issue the ORAD for this, include a condition that says that the wetland boundary is confirmed accurate, but the status of it as BVW or IVW is not confirmed. Okay. That sounds okay with you. Okay, great. Questions, comments from the commission? Questions, comments from the audience? All right, if I can get a motion to approve the notice of, uh, or the abbreviated notice of resource area delineation for the site. So moved. And a second, please. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion carries. All right, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Okay, um, Dominguez 128 Hayward Street. This is a notice of intent uh, continued for an above ground pool. Good evening. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. I have uh, 11 by 17 if anybody wants one. I don't know if anybody needs an updated one. Uh, did I print those in the yeah, I think you actually provide them, Kim. You have them in your packets. Yeah. These are the ones from today. Yeah. Yeah. So, just for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Amanda Cavalieri. I'm with Gary Ehrenhounen, rep representing Fatima Dominguez, um, who's uh, proposing to put uh, an above-ground pool on her property. Um, when we last spoke, um, we've had a chance to update the plans based on comments received from Lucas Environmental. Um, in addition to those comments, uh, we had been talking with um, the agent and going over a couple additional revisions. So one of them was um, the wetland markers, the permanent uh, markers for uh, that would go on the chain link fence. We had originally proposed in our narrative to Lucas Environmental that we would put them 16 feet on center. We had since talked to our client and they had asked if there was a possibility where it's the chain link fence and it's looking out into their backyard if they could be spaced out a little bit more. So when talking with the agent, uh, she suggested 30 to 40 feet on center. Um, so that would reduce the, the number of those markers on the fence line. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been reflected on this plan under item, it would be comment two, under the construction sequence that we've added to the plan at the top. 
Uh, the other uh, recent change, which was a last minute change from the applicant, was that we had originally proposed a 12 by 18 above ground pool. And based on the pool suppliers that she's been speaking with, uh, she's looking at a 12 by 24. So it, it extends uh, parallel to the wetland buffer as opposed to going closer to, so it would extend horizontally. Uh, the width, width that was originally proposed is still the same. So it'd just be a little bit longer within the previously disturbed grass area. So those are the only two changes since we had submitted our revised plans to the Lucas Environmental for the review. Um, we've added erosion control to the plans, the permanent um, immovable barrier, that will be the chain link fence around the back, um, and we've updated the construction sequence uh, both on the plans and the project narrative. The proposed pool will be salt water, so it will not be chlorinated, and we've also identified in the construction sequence um, based on comments received from Lucas Environmental that no backwash or discharge of any chlorinated water, which it will be salt water, um, would be down gradient towards the resource area. Um, Self-latching, self-locking gates, we've gone through the International Swimming Pool and Spa Code section. Um, as far as the um, area below the fence, it didn't appear that we needed to have the gap. Um, below it where it's a four foot and there's conservation area, I believe, or town owned land on the either side of the property as well. Um, so as far as accessibility or anything else in the rear of the property, it should be, um, okay. should be all set. Um, I think that's it as far as, as far as the NOI goes with the revisions. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Joe, any comments? Uh, just, uh, yeah, I, I reviewed the uh, responses and I think uh, everything was adequately addressed. It looks like the appropriate changes were made on the on the plan. Um, I just had one question. Um, there won't be any discharge of chlorinated back uh, chlorinated water. Um, where will, it, will the salt water be discharged? Salt water, I believe they have the filter through there um, and we can look at the maintenance uh, protocol. I'm not sure. It wouldn't be discharged down gradient. Down gradient, it would be discharged to the left or the right. It wouldn't be directly discharged. There's actually, um, in the driveway there, there's a um, drywell. drywell for the roof drains. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if we could have, just could have a special condition to discharge it to that. They could pump it up there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's significantly okay. higher. Well, there's, so one, the, there's one right under the deck. There's a, that's an infiltration chamber. There should be, um, so they have a chambers out in the back by the deck and then up on the right side of the driveway, there is a infiltration catch basin uh, that is up there, but that retaining wall that abuts the back of the property, there's a significant elevation difference. Mm. Um, so they would be required to pump it up, but they'll have a pump anyways for the pool. So we yeah, can, it should be okay, I would yeah. think, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can just include that as a special condition. Uh, okay, comments from commission members? Is this the property that is this past the beach? Is this the property that we had a notice of intent for the old parking driveway area in the front and the wall along the lake? Before the this is past past the parking lot to Sandy Beach, right? No, it's up above the parking lot. Yeah. Depends which way to drive. Well, no. <laughs> well, I was never comfortable. With that. I thought it was the house that was past the beach, I don't know. Heading down Lake, Lake Shore. Lake Shore, right? Yeah, yeah. it's up on Hayward, yeah. um, Jim. I see it. And this, this project actually has a prior order of conditions that has since expired. Uh, I don't know if that'll go on the next hearing um, or not. We had requested a certificate of compliance and it was pending. Um, we went through with the notice of intent. We had filed that uh, as well, but we wanted to make sure. Um, yeah, I think we addressed that at the last meeting, right, Kim? Mm, Did we? Yep. But we didn't close it. 
Yep, so Let's schedule it for the next hearing. I kind of dropped the ball on that. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Yep. So this way, the stuff that was proposed in the old order yeah, will transfer PIBs, over to this one. Yep. Uh, in place now. And same location as they were originally proposed. Yeah. yeah. So I don't see a problem with that, but we'll discuss it at the next meeting. Okay. Since it's not Great. on the uh, agenda for tonight. Thank you. Uh, okay. Were there questions from the audience? If I get a motion to close and approve the notice of intent uh, sure, for, for uh, yes. another one. I'm looking at the aerial photograph. Behind the house. GIS. On, on, yeah, town's GIS uh, with the aerial. It doesn't look like there's enough room in the back for maybe. Is that Stevens? Do you have an aerial? Do you have a, I mean, I mean, an aerial I mean, view, Kim? Give me a minute. Great pictures. Oh, is it? I agree with what Jim's looking at. I just don't know if that's necessarily accurate. But from what Jim's yeah, the width, at on GIS. the width of the pool is 12 feet. Mm -hmm. They even said that. Nope, they were recently surveyed. Yeah, I mean, it's through the chair. No, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, a lot of times those uh, GIS uh, property lines are. Are off. Uh, I'm sorry. The GIS property lines are off and off. Yeah, um, they are. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Right. What, what Kim is showing there is what Jim's looking at. From the back of the house, that green line looks like maybe. Well, it looks like there's a shadow the there. Well, that's not <laughs> there. There's a shadow. Yeah. Maybe the shadow is part of the deception. Yeah. Oh, I agree with Joe because I used to draw the property lines back when I was a GIS tech and. <laughs> They were not based on anything, really. I'm not very worried about that. I'm just supporting Jim and that what he was looking at. <laughs> okay, um, so is there a motion to approve the NOI with a special condition of the discharge to the existing chamber, underground chamber on site? So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. You too. Okay, seven Cubs Path is a continuation of a notice of intent for an addition that's been continued out to the next meeting, which brings us to Rebel Hill LLC. This is a continuation of a notice of intent, uh, 188 and 190 Fruit Street for two single family houses. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Give us uh, kind of a quick update just the way you guys are. Sure. Um, so I think since the last meeting, um, we've gone back and forth with Beta. We did receive an updated peer review letter from them, or last week or so. Mm -hmm. um, seems like uh, all the issues have been resolved in uh, from their letter, uh, with a few conditions that we that we talked about previously. Um, we've also submitted. I have copies of these, um, if they're not in your guys' packet. Um, phasing plans, uh, I think that was one request, uh, and I can I want to take a look at these. Thank you. Get more too. If you need some. So I think one of the one of the concerns was phasing of this, um, how to do temporary and permanent erosion control, um, something that the contractor will have on the record that they will need to follow. Um, so we put together basically three phases. Um, so the, the first plan shows if you were going to do bulb houses at the same time. Um, it's phase one, roughing in the driveway, the respective erosion control notes along with that. The second phase shows those driveways roughed in with the erosion control and working on the houses and the two stockpile locations. And then the third phase is just finalizing um, the landscaping around, around the lot. And then 
the next few pages just break out if you were to do 188 by itself and mm -hmm. those respective three phases with similar notes um, and then the last three pages are if you were to do 190 by itself uh, at a single time with those temporary and permanent erosion control notes as well. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a couple, couple more. Um, so I guess one of the questions in the letter was about the stormwater. We uh, haven't been able to go out and do a test pit in the location of the basin just because of the stockpile location. There's significant earthwork to get down to that elevation. Um, we actually worked with Beta. We ran the numbers, um, assuming no infiltration, even if you were to get no infiltration there, um, you still reduce the peak rates um, to that wetland. Um, obviously, from the test pit that we that we had previously and, and around there, it looks pretty good. Uh, the NRCS info would be probably a low C, which you would get some infiltration. Uh, but we want to be super conservative and just show that that would still work from stormwater wise. Um, and then the last one, we did get a letter recently came forwarded from the DPW about concern on drainage with Fruit Street, um, the catch basin that. Uh, the, the picture of the catch basin that was shown was actually upstream um, of this lot, so we're not doing any work uh, contributing to that. But then we went and we looked at uh, what is contributing to the Fruit Street drainage and what would be eventually going down to, to this wetland. Um, and we actually reduced the area that goes there, and although some of it is portion of the 188 driveway, uh, we do reduce the peak rates to Fruit Street as well. Um, so with that reduction in area, we would reduce- Just the Fruit Street, right? We reduce peak rates everywhere, uh, match or reduce to all of the design points. So we, we do meet the stormwater standards, but we were looking at just Fruit Street as well, uh, because ultimately that all goes to that design point too. So I think the question was, okay, are you over mitigating with this basin and sending a lot more water to Fruit Street? Mm -hmm. And the answer would be no, we are actually reducing what's going on to Fruit Street as well as reducing overall. Through the chair? Yes, ma'am. Did you look at volumes for that analysis or just peak rates? Uh, just looked at peak rates. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for thank you. Yes, Jim, go ahead. Um, I just want to say this is a nice plan. It's phased. It's what we should be getting. I don't think I've seen anything like this where it's been detailed and what the phases uh, are going to be. And then I'll ask the question. We spoke earlier about Chamberlain Whalen. Uh, you're going to have walls working around to build these houses, right? So how can you stabilize, what, what do you do to stabilize that? Uh, somebody re, you know, previously commented, can't do any stabilization until you're done building the house. So you're working around these buildings if you do this, um, but you've already stabilized a substantial portion of the site, right? Is that with seeding, at least some annual uh, you know, ryegrass or something to stabilize it? Correct, yeah. So low on it yet. No. Right? No, so they're creating it. <laughs> you're throwing some seed down. And that's what I'm saying. I don't understand why everybody can't do that. Thank you. Can I ask a yeah. question yeah. to the chair? Um, the phasing plans here, so there's two different types. Is this an option for the contractor, or are you deciding between the two, whether doing both at the same time or one at a time? Is that something that you're going to decide and tell yeah. the contractor, or? So, to answer that, we, you know, we're trying to give the owner of the properties the option, like if he decides to develop them himself at the same time, we have a phasing plan that <clears throat> addresses how to do that, but they are individual lots. So if, if one were to be sold, we wanted the option to, for that lot to be able to be developed on its own too, without being tied to timing of the other one, because I don't know how you could legally control that. 
so we were kind of we thought that that was the best safety net to cover the development of these lots the most responsible way to make sure that whomever does it myself or someone else is a plan for it mm -hmm. I, I mean i think obviously for us the separate phasing where you're only opening half the site um, is a lot more desirable than opening the whole entire site in that initial phase. Yeah, definitely, I, mean, I agree, it's Melissa. still a lot of area. Right. Even though it's phased, it's the majority of it here is, is open. Yeah, and that's, you know, that was one of the, you know, I'll go into some of the things that I wanted to talk about on this site, but one of them was, and I appreciate you putting this phasing plan together. Um, you know, I think it was well thought out. There's some different options, but the reality of it is, is when you guys sell the property to someone else, there's no way to impose, you know, you have to do this, right? It's up to them and how they want to open and develop the site. Um, I guess is is that the case if these are attached to the order? To the order, and well, it's different options. So, <clears throat> you know, we could have the more preferable one as Melissa specified, where we're opening the site in two phases, attached to the order. But I think having all of them attached to the order doesn't really make sense because then someone's going to come in and that you know, I can you know, I can pick whichever one of these I want, right? Um. I think we're open to that. I think the hard thing to address is if they were, if they were going to be developed at once, right? And we just want to make sure there's an option for that. Right. Um. I guess that might be something that the commission decides whether they would approve or not. Considering the way things have gone. Yeah. I mean, here lately. Not a few folks probably aren't aware of this, but we have a few other sites in town where, you know, the development is significantly larger scale than this, but, you know, we have the same problem with, you know, the soils aren't great with the infiltration, steep slopes. The entire site was opened up. And you can imagine what the issues are with that from a commission standpoint. Um, so I just wanted to kind of tick through a couple of the things that crossed my mind when I was taking a look at this today because, you know, I think it's at the point now where I don't want to keep asking you guys for more information. I think, you know, we're at the point and you've done a great job of looking at this, addressing our concerns. Um, putting, you know, the schematics and, and, you know, plans together for us and all the supplemental information. So, you know, you, you've done a really good job with that. And, uh, you know, we, we appreciate that. So I'm going to just kind of highlight a couple things that I thought of. Um, so, you know, as you know, the soil conditions at the site are less than ideal. You know, the slow, uh, slow infiltration, um, you know, coupled with uh, steep grades, you know, as I just discussed, and there's the proximity to kind of the resource areas, you know, downgrading from the site. Uh, the site drains to Cedar Swamp. Uh, to the north, which is an area of critical environmental concern and an outstanding resource waterway by the DEP. Um, and a portion of the site is also located within a DEP um, interim wellhead protection area. 6,900 cubic yards of soil is going to be excavated as part of the project for two single family home. Uh, single-family homes, that seems like a lot to me. Associated with that, you know, there's the erosion and sedimentation, you know, pre- and post-construction, um, and those are, you know, pretty significant concerns um, in my mind. The 
septic location at the 190 uh, Fruit Street portion of the development is located up gradient of the vernal pool and it's less than the 100 foot um, uh, boundary from the 125 foot vernal pool no disturb zone. I think we're outside of that. You're outside of that? Yeah, we are. Out, we, we moved that to be outside of that. Okay. All right. Cross that one off then. My apologies. Um, the, so the test fit data, I understand the constraints you guys had at the project. You know, my concern with using the data from other portions of the site is that, you know, we have a very tight site here. So once the project's approved and construction starts, you go in and do the test pits and the data isn't, um, doesn't work for those locations, we're kind of in a sticky situation at that point, right? Because, you know, what are, you, what are we gonna do? Um, it's gonna be a project change request. Um, potentially, um, you know, it's just, I, I, you know, I have a, um, I don't leave something as significant as an infiltration or a detention basin um, location kind of being left, you know, up in the air until data is collected, you know, after the project's approved, if that makes sense. Um, sorry, but I just want to make sure that, you know, we're thorough in our analysis of this project. You guys saw the email from our DPW director. You know, I understand that the catch basin is, uh, that, that she references located upgrading it, but there's still a significant amount of water that flows off the site, sheds off the site into the roadway. Um, you know, so there's flooding issues as as they had indicated and potential, you know, erosion issues on the roadway. Um, and that southern driveway is, I think, the only portion of the property where, you know, it directly discharges down to Fruit Street. Um, so that, you know, was just an issue that I thought was of concern. Um, the construction phasing, you know, I think we talked about this, if we can, you know, if you're willing to agree to putting the, uh, the phasing plan in where one portion of the site is opened up at a time as part of the, you know, I think that's something that the commission would want to see as opposed to submitting all three as part of the order. And then the last um, kind of thing that I went through is, you know, the o &M plan that was submitted for the site. I took a look at that and it just seems very unrealistic and impracticable for me for single family homeowners. You know, I'll just tick a couple items off. So, uh, you know, it said um, sweep or vacuum at least four times per year. Um, with a rotary brush sweeper, you know, and properly dispose of any of the material that's collected. You know, catch basins inspected four times a year and cleaned a minimum of one time a year. Uh, sediment needs to be pumped from the catch basins once per year. You know, and then infiltration basins inspected after, you know, every storm event. And those are just a few of them that jumped out at me. And, you know, I just have to ask, I mean, is it realistic to expect that a homeowner is going to do all that on these sites? I, I think we all know the answer to that. Um, so those were kind of my comments. I'll open it up to the other commission members. Um, Chair? Ah, uh, yes. So uh, I'm not trying to talk about how old I am. I got a 40-year experience of dealing with projects like this that went into what was a vernal pool behind my house. So I've seen it for 40 years. I've walked this site, you, you know. Um, I could be convinced that this could support one lot, but I can't be convinced it can support two.
I, I guess I'll say I'm in the same place where Ed is in his final conclusion. Uh, I don't know that I even love one lot, but if there's any chance for me, it would be a one lot development. Um, but I do want to say I love these. Um, my negative reaction to two lots certainly is not because you haven't done your work. It's because of what Mother Nature has left us in that spot um, and what Mother Nature's systems do, especially in the last couple of years. Um, but I think this is a model presentation that I wish our other developers would follow. Um, but I can't see two houses on that piece of earth uh, with those slopes, with the dirt removal, and all of that. Jeff? Yes. yes. Hi. So I hear you guys. What? I, I'm not sure I see what the advantage of one lot versus two is. Assuming that the one lot would, would include a, the house way back and not the one up toward the front. I don't think I'm making that assumption. Well, if you were to put only one house, where would it be? In the back or the front? <clears throat> I mean, you wouldn't choose one of these. You would do something down the middle or something. I honestly haven't looked at it yet. I don't know that Still there's a, a substantial of difference of one right. versus two. Yeah, I, I think, all. if I may, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's I right. think what Ed said and what I agree with is maybe I could be convinced <laughs> of one, not I would approve one. I think there's a much better chance of finding a way. I don't know what that way is. That one, Ed, am I speaking correctly? That's yeah, probably I mean, where you're you know, The from. first thing is we have a driveway that's going through the buffer zone. But with one lot only, it would still go through the buffer zone. I don't think it not would necessarily, but we're not here to design what that one lot No, I understand. I'm just trying to think of what to, I'm trying to figure out what would be the advantage of an alternative of one lot, one building. One building two lots. We haven't looked at the one lot, I think. Two dogs on one wheel. I, I think that it would likely just talk and make care of looking at it, would likely still go through the buffer zone, but I mean I completely understand your perspective. Really I think from my perspective we've really worked hard to listen to the commission and all the other um, departments and municipalities of the town. Mm -hmm. We've taken all that into consideration. We these are two lots legally. Um, the commission wanted to hear this project as two lots, not one. It, um, since they are legally two lots, and that's what we're here for tonight. Um, and we've done the best we can to incorporate all those comments to make sure that these lots are developed responsibly. I mean, I, I don't know how much more we, we could do if there's suggestions or if it's simply no. I, I don't, you know. We're here for two lots tonight, I guess. That's that's the bottom line. Okay. Yeah. And I do think it would impact the buffer zone, even if it was still one lot. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't think the commission ever directed the project to be, you know, we want to evaluate this as two lots. That was what was, so th that was the notice of intent that was proposed to us, right? Okay. Yeah, so we, we had talked previously and, and we had that discussion with Kim. Do we want to come in as two separate lots or should we come in as w with two notice of intents or should we come in at one? And since it was going to be looked at together cumulatively, cumulatively right. the recommendation was to come in with one notice of intent, I assuming we're doing if we were doing the two lots instead of coming right. with two I notice of intents. I, yes. Yes. I can just I mean, that is yeah. the recommendation I made. This could have gone either way, but yeah. I think it, it would have been the, the same, like we, the commission would have looked at the lots cumulatively. Um, so, so my point is, yeah. yeah. No, I think that was a good recommendation on Kim's, um, uh, that was a good recommendation on Kim's part, you know, so we could look at the cumulative impacts as opposed to individual sites. Um, and I, you know, I, I, as I recall, when we were looking at this, you know, this has been before the commission now for four or five months, as I recollect, you know, I think, I don't know if it was, if I made the comment or someone else on the commission made the comment that, you know, two lots, seem like a lot to kind of bite off on this project, right? Um, because of, you know, at that point it was because of the grading 
Um, you know, we knew the infiltration rates of the soils um, and some of the concerns we were having at other projects in town over the past three years. So, you know, to Jim's point and to Ted's point, I mean, the presentation, the work that you guys done, have done on this has been outstanding. Um, but, you know, I, I, again, I don't want to, yep, go ahead, Jim. Um, thanks, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I look at this, well, I'm not advocating for one thing or the other. I, I'm looking at simply, I'm looking at this as if the one that's in the back is very similar to the West Elm Street uh, that went way up the hill, right along the property boundary of the abutter. I forget the address, you might recall. Very difficult site. Um, if these lots were owned separately and one owner came in and said, asked for, you know, and applied for a permit for, let's say, the one in the rear, we would look at that and you know, we condition it, let's assume we condition it. And then the next, the, the owner of the next property comes in and proposes developing the house where that is, we would likely condition that too. And they'd be two separate, two separate analyzed, two separate applications. By doing it this way, as Kim, you know, directed, we get to look at the cumulative. We wouldn't be able to if there were two separate lots. We'd have two separate lots to know what. <laughs> Uh, so in our bylaw, there's a provision that's basically like a look back provision. If the land is subdivided uh, after, I forget what the date is, but the date of the, the effective date of the bylaw, the commission looks at development on both of those lots cumulatively. Yeah, but I'm, uh, what I'm saying is th this predates that. These lots were divided, predated that, so they're separate. The yeah, they're subject to this provision. To that because provision. they're adjoining? Because they Separate were owners? because they were A and R'd from the golf club in the late '90s or early 2000s. Um, after that provision. Okay, went so if the owner had sold one of the lots or or both lots individually, we would have to consider them. The second one that came in, let's say, would be I don't know at a disadvantage because the first one's taken up, you know, using up whatever all the compensation and. When the second one comes in, it's, you know, too bad we already... And this is kind of the conversation that we had with the applicant earlier. See, I, I look at them as if they predated, that the subdivision predated all that, and they're just two separate lots. I don't think we would necessarily approve one or the other in the current condition. I mean, well, like we would condition it in some way. No? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's, you know, that's not where we're at. So we have a oh, filing yeah. before us with the two lots. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess, you know, do you guys want us to vote on this? Um, we ultimately approve. Because they changed yeah, it. I, 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 you know, I hate to keep right. dragging you out, you yeah. know, asking for more information. <clears throat> um, I think they've done the best they can. Because I think, you know, <laughs> People are leaning in, you know, one direction or the other. You now the commission members. Um, so I think it's probably just, you know, makes sense. I think to vote on it more so. I think so too. I mean, I, I think they've done everything they could for two lots. I didn't catch that. I apologize. I didn't hear. What's that? I didn't hear what you said. I said, uh, oh, one more question. Sorry, oh, sorry. I said, yes, I don't think there's anything else that they could come forward with with, with the intentions to houses to yeah. change anybody's opinion. Yeah. In other words, it's time to vote. Yes. Yeah. Can I just ask a question before we vote? If there is a denial, does that impact us coming back? That it's not like the site plan approval process or something where you need to wait a certain amount of time to come back with a new proposal. No, nope, you can do a request for reconsideration. I was just about to say, so <clears throat> Hopkinton is all unique and special. We have something in our bylaw called a request for reconsideration that can get filed on a bylaw denial within 10 days, and the commission can decide if they want to hear that or not. So um, if you did want to present, you know, modifications to the plan to the commission um, under a request for reconsideration, you can do that. Um, typically, the commission entertains requests that are significant changes to the plan. Um, 
<clears throat> can the lots not be heard individually, though? I'm still a little confused about that because to, to because Jim's Here's point, you know, if the owner was to sell one lot and then come before you, right, to be conditioned or for some sort of approval, and then did the same thing to somebody else, I don't. But as Kim has said, how could you tie them? There's a look back period, so we would look at even if. He sold one to you know this person, another one to this person. Mm -hmm. You know we still would look at it as cumulative impacts uh, because it was t you know the property was tied together. Okay. <clears throat> well, I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic on the vote. I mean, I feel like we've we've satisfied uh, you know third party review and spoken to all the departments. I certainly understand the perspective. You know, not combative in that way at all. But I do think that we've properly. Uh, plan for development on these two house lots. Okay. Um, before we vote, are there any questions or comments from the audience? Okay, so let's uh, we'll separate the vote under the act and the bylaw. If I can get a motion to close and approve the project um, as discussed under the Wetlands Protection Act. So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor? All right. This is under the Act. This is under the Act. Oh. Which does not regulate the buffer zone as we do. Yep. So all in favor under the Act? Aye. 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 I'm going to abstain. No. Present. Okay. So four ayes, one abs. One uh, abstain, abstination, I guess, and one, uh, one, yeah, no. Okay, and is there a motion under the bylaw to close and approve the project? I'll make that motion. I'll and second. All in favor? Of closing. Closing and approving under the bylaw. Aye. And opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, so one, four, the remaining against. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Don't interpret my nay vote as disregarding the work. <laughs> yes, it's certainly not lack of effort. It's, it's property jig. Get from the golf course. You can't get it from the golf if you walk on the golf course. No, I need it. 17 okay. the Come up, yeah. In the parking. Okay, Hopkins and Stone and Garden has been continued out to um, September 12th. So we'll move on to Labor's Training Trust Fund, 37 East Street. This is a continuation of a notice of intent for an, an alternative gas line alignment. Good evening, Mr. Connors. Good evening. I think when we last met, we were waiting for a file number from DEP that's come in. Area of consideration of this particular one, the one that emanates from uh, Front Street, is areas in what we call the campus proper. And we have the pond here, we have the Coya building, which was built, um, I don't know, probably in the 80s. There are new buildings going in in this location. Surrounding the pond is driveways. I'm sorry, Mr. Connors. I'm having trouble hearing you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you speak up a little bit, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, the campus proper is the area of consideration. I don't know. Kim's got that. Okay. And um, the DP's uh, hesitance to issue the file number was understanding that the um, work in the river zone was in previously disturbed areas. Um, the driveways go all around the pond. It's gravel along this area, and then there's pavement going out in this direction. There's pavement going in this uh, in this direction here, mm -hmm. and um, then the Maloney building up here has pavement. This is a uh, construction yard where they have uh, a lot of pavement. So all of the um, gas line uh, installation is in areas that have been or uh, that have been um, driveways either paved or gravel since prior to 1966. We've demonstrated that with some um, uh, GIS imagery. 
uh, they will be restored the way they were. I think you may recall we had a section in here where the electric company wanted to reinforce the power grid, and you approved that as an amendment, and that's been installed. That was maybe a day or so. There's a three-foot deep um, ditch that goes around here, and the pipe was in. And, uh, of course, we are going under the uh, culverts for the pond mm -hmm. that carry the stream by directional drilling, which we've done uh, four times before for electric communications, sewer, and um, water. Uh, the rest of this is generally in areas that were the first portion of the site that was built back in, I think, the 60s. Okay. So I don't know if there's anything else I can add to that. Nope. I think um, so that has been covered in previous meetings. I think we're good with that. Uh, what we were looking for was the DEP file number to be issued, which it has been and for a kind of a complete package of information to be submitted to Kim, um, which I think we have obtained at this point, um, for the most part. Uh, Joe, did you have questions? Uh, I do not. I, I think uh, my previous comments were addressed and we were waiting for the information that you had just stated. Okay. Questions, comments from commission members? Questions or comments from the audience? Yes. Yes, sir. Can't be it, but anyway, does this concern the pipeline down Maple Ave? No. Okay, yeah, we can't hear Joe. You can speak up. No, we can't. it's not the pipeline down Maple Ave. The wetlands portion of it is in the campus proper. Thank you. The jurisdictional portion. Any other questions? Okay, if I can get a motion to close and issue the uh, notice of intent for laborers training, um, the alternative gas line alignment. I moved. And the second, please. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you, Mr. Connors. Thank you. So, uh, just w if I can just. Uh, um, talk to future filings for a minute here on this property. Uh, we just wanted to let you guys know, Labor's training your client, that the NRAD has expired at this point. Okay. Um, and, you know, for future filings, I don't think we have a very accurate cumulative uh, impact for the entire site, so we would just need that. that now. I don't think we do. Like, I'm, think, I'm thinking like total work area, like are we exceeding, how many acres are we of open space at any one time? There's so many different projects going on at mm -hmm. once. I think I need a better grasp on. I'll ask Vito, I think you have that. Cumulatively, I have so many documents at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and they keep getting resubmitted in different forms, so I really need greater clarity about, and we also have multiple projects at multiple times, so I'm getting a little nervous about single and complete project status. Mm -hmm. um, I'll ask him in the morning. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Mr. Connors. Thank you. Yep. Have a good evening. Um, okay. Toll Brothers. Um, this is 11 Fitch Ave. A notice of intent continued for a single family house for Myrtle Ave. A notice of intent uh, continued for a single family house. And 13 Finch Ave. A notice of intent uh, continued for a single family house. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Um, just I'll do some introductions while Matt gets the boards. Uh, again, I'm Ted Merchant, I'm the development director with Toll Brothers. I have with me Ann Martin from LEC and Matt Ashley from Bowler Engineering. Uh, you guys want to give us a site plan? Site plans are in your packets as well. Thank you. An additional 11 by 17 and it makes sense to identify what you have. All right, you want to give us an update on where you guys are at? Yes. So, last time we were here, we looked at lots 14 and 15 um, after our initial hearing. Um, so, we wanted to uh, move on to lots 47, 52, and 54. Uh, 
course on top of my pile here. If you want to start with that one, if that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. I just can. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> we use addresses, not lot numbers. So, like, if you if you use 54, can you just tell me what address that corresponds with, please? Because that's how the carries are done. 54 is 13 Fitch Ave. You're welcome. Okay. Wow. So, um, last time we were here in front of uh, the board, or two hearings ago, uh, sorry, Matthew Ashley with Bowler, I don't know if I said that yet. Um, <laughs> Uh, we looked at um, this particular lot, which um, had a larger um, footprint in it, um, and you asked us to take a look at if there was any other different scenarios which this house could be put out on the property to reduce any impacts to the 100 foot buffer. Um, so as part of that, we went back um, to AutoCAD and, and laid out and looked at total uh, products. Um, and out of that, we were able to reduce um, the house footprint uh, pretty significantly down to essentially the, the smallest footprint size uh, of the house here. Um, so from a, can you just quantify what that is? It went from how many square feet to what? Sorry to interrupt. No worries. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, this is shown at 2,800 square feet. Yeah. Oh, so that's different than what I'm looking at here. I'm seeing 3,300. Yeah, I think that was the previous one. That, okay. Yeah. Let me see if I can find it. Um, so yeah, the house footprint size, or the... That's different than the house. It was typical, I think what we'll see later on lot 52 was that that was the smallest house footprint size. So that's what the product that was put into here. Um, do, you, do you guys have what we're talking, I want to make I sure that they have it. I think this is 4055 on yeah, this one, no? The latest plans you and I talked to were 8-3, right? 3 8-3. Yep. I see 877 seven plans one. dated 8-3. Revision 1? That's what I see. Yep, that's what I have. That's what that is? Yep. All right. It looks different. Uh, yeah, because this, oh. so the plan that I have. It's wrong plan. <laughs> The oh. plan that I have is showing the house at 3,300 square feet, and this is showing it at yeah. 2,800. Oh, that's this, right? I don't know. I'm yeah. just using this number, right? Uh, oh. Uh, oh. Apologies. I think, I think that's the wrong number you guys have. So it's the same size footprint that you're seeing on there, but that number, the 3,300 number. But the footprint isn't changed, the which really is what affects us. So the footprint's not 3,300. No, the, the footprint got reduced. But the number didn't The number change. didn't change. The new number is the 2,800 that we're talking about. So it was reduced from 3,300 to 2,800. Correct. The square footage of the but house. the footprint itself is the same. No, footprint went down. That's the footprint it did. size. So yep. what happened was they changed the footprint of the building, but they forgot to change the Oh, uh, okay. That's so all, this yeah. square is drawn correctly. But this has all the right stuff. Yeah, if you take a look here, off. this is what it was before. A little side by side comparison. Okay. Look at. Okay. Apologies for the confusion there. Yeah, no worries. Let me sure we. Um, and then, as part of that process, too, um, typical to the other lots we looked at, uh, this board asked us to look at different driveway scenarios and, and flopping them in different directions. Um, and this particular setup that we initially had in there ultimately was the best location for the driveway for impacts to the buffer. Okay. We appreciate you reducing the square footage. Um, which, and then this new setup ultimately re, um, had a reduction in impacts to that buffer, um, roughly about 600 square feet because of that. Um, the other thing um, which the board mentioned 
the last thing that we did on this lot was uh, initially we came in with a 40 foot backyard um, to what we were accustomed to seeing in Hoffman. Um, but because of the feedback we received from the board, that was reduced down to 30 feet. Um, and then ultimately, if that 30 feet went into the 50 foot buffer, um, we stayed out of that as well in general and minimized the yard in that area as you can see. Okay. And that's all the updates I had for lot 54. Uh, all right, Chair. Yes. Does, does this subdivision oh. regs predate comment? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Wasn't that for the road, not the houses? I thought, that I thought was it was for the road, not the houses. For the road, right. right. But not the houses. Yeah. It's for the road and the, you know, the subdivision layout, right, Kim? Not the actual... Um, wetland and resource area boundaries related to the single family homes. This is such a complex. Uh, so the road, the lot layouts themselves, the roadway configuration is all a legacy permit through planning board. The construction of single family home on a lot is a new filing. But it's definitely limited, you know, the filings that we're looking at are limited in scope to construction of a single family home on a lot. Under the updated and new bylaw. I would interpret it as such because it's being filed now. Yep. That makes sense. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. I can move on to the next one. Yep. I, I, I saw a hand go up yeah. and go down. Are yeah. we going to go through three and then go back to each one, or are we doing each one at a time? What do you mean? Well, here's my question. So I, I know you're, you're, with, you're right on the 50-foot setback from the road, correct? You could get a variance for that. You could ask for one. If the house wasn't oriented, uh, I'll say, parallel, alongside, parallel to the road, but it was angled, you could get, it seems like you could get uh, a lot more of it out of the DISTI, if it was brought forward and in, in, uh, angled, come in from, uh, well, you know what I mean? So. So you want to make it? Well, you have to have a fair. I'm, I'm looking at getting it as much out of the fifty as possible. Meaning up and in, in like this, oriented this way or the other way. You know, not not parallel like this, but like this or like this. But you need a variance for the fifty foot setback. Is that you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And if I may, just to confirm, the ground slopes toward the wetland. Right, which is why the neighbors yes, that, right. are, are here right. because all of that water slips in that direction. Yeah, it's, it's like a split just about halfway through the house. The front yard will go front, the back will go back. Oh, really? On this particular lot? Yeah, I think the right side is favored a little towards one side, but it's, essentially it's just about at the halfway mark. Okay. So, yeah, Jeff, I don't know if you want to go through all of them and then have comments. But I think that was Jim's kind of question. Or yeah, we can, we I mean, let's, on this let's go through each individual one and then you comment on it. I think that is easiest. Okay. So my biggest comment is, I think I heard you say the Toll Brothers model is the smallest house, is this particular one, yes. right? So you're deciding, the company is deciding that's the smallest we will build. Given that, I, I appreciate you turn 40 into 30, but seeing what we've seen with other developments, including Chamberlain Wayland, to put the edge of work right on the 50-foot buffer line as the ground slopes towards the wetland gives me reason for real pause based on issues we're seeing on other developments. There is no room for error there at all. And 
whether it's Mother Nature's fault or the contractor's fault, we're seeing error in abundance. So that gives me a real pause. And nearly half the house is in the 100 foot buffer zone. Yeah, so I, I, I appreciate the adjustments for the smaller house in the yard, but it's still a little bit too much incursion for me. Or a lot more. <laughs> Not a little bit more. Okay, let's move on to the next one. What's the next one you have in your packet? Uh, lot 52. I, I, and the address on that is? <laughs> Which one is this? I think it's 4 Myrtle Ave. Oh. <laughs> This is lot 52, 4 Myrtle. Yes. All right. All right. So, um, lot 52. Um, so, just to recap what's happening here on this particular um, unit, um, the house size has stayed the same, which is typical to the house product that we just looked at. Um, in this particular instance, um, the side yard, which you can see in the setback, is graded in a way to run away from the buffer. Um, it is swaled around back to the other side of the house. Um, and this comment here as well, um, there was a 40-foot um, backyard, which kind of goes planned north and actually happens to be north as well. Um, and that was reduced down to 30 in the backyard. So um, as a result of this, there was um, a minor reduction in square footage, about 250 square feet uh, because of that. Um, and then also, I think um, something I forgot to mention previously is um, there was a request for us to show you proposed utility connections um, out here um, and stabilized driveway, which was added to these plans from the previous set that was looked at. And that was typical to the other one as well. Chair? Uh, yes. Yeah. What's the width of the side yard? Um, Looks to be about 20 feet from the two setbacks in the The side yard is 20, the backyard is 30. Is that what I just understood the question was? Okay. Questions from the commission? Yeah. I think you need to move the house, which requires a variance on the side. You get it out of the box. Well, or maybe a shaped house that's not so deep on the right side. <laughs> so it can move over and still be within the 25 there, and there is a house in <laughs> There is a house in Marblehead where the corner of the house is like lopped off. <laughs> We, we aren't so custom as that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the little squiggly arrows, is that the flow of water? Yes. Correct. Yeah. I would say for my part, I'm, I feel much more favorably about this or this lot than the last. Yes. The size of the yards feel better. Yep. It's, the water flows away from the wetlands. Um, I feel much, much better about this one. Okay. On. Yep. Move on. Last of the three properties. Sorry. Whacking the books. Well, what you mean? Had a good idea. Um, I did. Is lot 47, which is 7 Adam, well, formerly 7 Adam Street, which is now 
Your agenda. Eleven fish. Should be eleven fish. Yeah. Alright, I got too many papers. It's on the agenda. I know. <laughs> if I can find the agenda. <laughs> You say you already got it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Anna assigns the addresses if you'd like something oh. special. <laughs> <laughs> name someone's name. Yeah. Give me an address. Um, um, so this one, um, out of the three, saw probably the most significant uh, change. Um, so, uh, again, we swapped out the house that was here, shrunk down in size to that smallest product. Um, and was kind of nestled up right into those setbacks um, from the two roadways. And then um, what was also asked of us uh, was, again, the orientation of the driveway, um, flipping the hand of house. Um, and we looked at um, a whole bunch of different scenarios here. Um, and this ended up being the least impactful, um, essentially, and then I think it brought it out of the 100 um, foot buffer essentially where it was in there before um, and then also got the driveway out of the 100 foot buffer which was one of the requests um, and, uh, as, a as a result of all those changes um, we saw a pretty large reduction of 4,000 uh, square feet out of the buffer um, and then typical to my other comments the backyard was brought in from 40 to 30 feet in those areas. Um, utilities were shown on the plans now um, and a stabilized driveway for construction. Okay, so this house went from 4,800 square feet approximately to the 2,800? Correct. I forget the exact square footage of the house previously, but yeah, it was just shrunk five. down. Um, my plan is shown at 4,855 square feet. Thank you. Okay, comments from the commission? Can you, do you remember your suggestion? This one makes yeah. me a lot happier, and I think we should, put whatever happens, we need to ensure that the drawings get updated to reflect the size of the houses as proposed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, we'll, we'll get the most updated over to Kim. Okay. Um, May I just say really quickly, I also think that this is much improved, mm -hmm. but I'm curious, did you, um, in our last meeting, Janine suggested talking to the planning board and saying since Adams Street is not really in existence, does that 25-foot setback have to be enforced? Did you consider having that discussion with them? So I'll answer that because I, I think that gets to the more global question here. Um, yes, we anticipate talking to the planning board about that. Um, the the more what I'll call global conversation is a stormwater update to the overall plan that brings um, the site to today's stormwater standards and staff asked us to investigate that um, we've done that we feel comfortable pretty comfortable um, making that update however um, there are some questions that remain to be answered legally through town council um, and the planning board on whether that constitutes a uh, full subdivision change or not. Hmm. Um, so we are waiting to hear the answer there um, before going in front of the planning board. Um, I think there was some communication as of like this afternoon that I don't know that we've fully digested yet. Mm -hmm. um, so. I believe the answer is we do anticipate going back, um, but there are some legal hurdles to jump. Okay. Through the chair? Uh, yes, Kim. I would add um, that in that email, it was sent today by, by John, the planner, um, he stated that town council advised that they do not foresee the removal of Adam Street as triggering additional regulatory requirements. So um, it would be up additional. additional regulatory requirements for Toll Brothers. So it would be up to you know Toll Brothers to take that under advisement and decide if that's something that they want to pursue. Can you do that again, Kim? I know this is like this is. No, no, that's speed. okay. I mean, I'm listening, but uh, Town Council has advised the Planning Board that they do not foresee the removal of Adam Street as triggering additional regulatory requirements for Toll Brothers. 
Okay. Uh, somebody interpret that because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? If they were afraid by abandoning Adams Street means they don't get grandfathered in under the old regulations for the development and it puts them under the new regulations. So okay. legal is, is that advising that, is that, what you that understand? legal is advising that that's not the case. That right. it won't is that what you're understanding? Yeah, that's what my comes? understanding and obviously, you know, it's up to Toll Brothers to decide if that's if that's something that they want to pursue, if they want to. Well, it's irrelevant. I just heard that it doesn't matter. Abandon the Adams Street, don't abandon the Adams Street. But planning board hasn't made the made that official decision yet. Oh, I see. Okay. But if Adams Street is abandoned, legal counsel says it won't change other right. things we're working with, and then the house could be slid over. I mean, as we know, right. whatever legal counsel says. That's that's my understanding too. That's okay. as of this afternoon. Okay. So we're cool. cool. I, I'm, I understand. We're not stamping everything as final. Right. I just. So, I like this a lot better, but mm -hmm. if the house could be moved over, it would be sunshine and rainbows to me. Yeah. <laughs> because then the backyard is also moved out of the buffer and all sorts of wonderful things happen. I, I think we'd prefer it too, honestly. Because okay. um, uh, then you might get a bigger house. That's yeah. also true. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, as long as you don't make it so big that you haven't like it could be lost out what and I bigger. want to be getting. <laughs> See, out and bigger. Leave this line right here. <laughs> we'll, uh, Okay, we'll take that under consideration. It sounds like something that we want to do anyway, um, but some, some moving parts here still. To limit even more the incursion into the 100-foot buffer would be wonderful. And if you get a bigger house out of it, as long as it's not in the 100, more power to you, I suppose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, currently the house is outside of the 100. What right, but the yard is. Touches the 100, right. I see the disturbance in the back. By the way, can I ask a, what? Can I ask a question, Jeff? Yes. So I see the no pro uh, proposed permanent wetland, whatever it's a marker. W on the illustration, what, what, how is that denoted? Are this the dark squares or dots? Where are those markers? Correct. The erosion control line. So I presume they're in that line after. Yeah, there's. there's a, sorry. Yeah, there's little black dots okay, that's um, what, at key points on the the. Uh, the okay. limit of disturbance Those then to note the, the markers. Yep. So in this case it would run along the entirety of the of the back, the rear of the house, right? But not south, I guess it should be. There probably should be some down there, no? Like in that t the bottom tail. Yeah. Right, so I mean generally it should follow the hundred, right? Hmm. So the bottom part, the, the curve yeah. to the south of the house, there aren't any of those dark uh, marks indicated. So yeah, that, that's no problem. Yeah. We need to note that. We would add, yeah. right? Okay. And the same thing with the other ones. Where it would be along the 100 or the or the whatever it is at, at this point. Whatever whatever the boundary is, it would be marked the entirety of the of the. Yeah, I think this one was a little unique um, as we weren't proposing um, significant development on that side, so yeah. that's why they weren't included. But the other ones okay. are essentially along the whole. No, yep. th this one would need additional ones too, which, yeah. which is fine. Okay. Um, but lot 52, which again, addresses are kind of screwing up. But, right. um, 54, yes, 52, I don't think there are additional ones. Yeah, no. uh, I'm with you on that. I would agree with what you just said. <laughs> okay. Um, so it would be good to have a firm um, understanding of what the intent is regarding the stormwater. If it's Toll Brothers' intent to upgrade the stormwater to current standards, that's um, very uh, significant in my mind, and I think the Commission would look at that as um, mitigation for some of these other uh, waivers that you're looking for on the project. Um, can I can I ask specific to individual lots? I mean, it sounds like the sentiment in general on 52 and 47 is good, and the sentiment on 54 is not so good. Does the stormwater upgrade change mines on 54? It impacts, um, you know, 
it certainly would look favorable in my opinion, but I can only speak for myself. I would have to understand. I think I'd need some data to help me understand that. Okay. Before I offer any thoughts one way or the other. Meaning the stormwater data? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, questions, comments from the audience? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Alex Scott. I'm at 15 Blueberry Lanes in my property of Butts uh, for Myrtle Ave. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the easement. And there's going to be a lot of trees taken down clear to that area um, right along my property on both the easement and the back property line. And I'm just wondering what sort of protections we have for those mature trees that have extensive root systems that are on my property that are on the edges of the boundaries of both the easement and the back property line. Uh, so the majority of the easement is out of our jurisdiction. Um, there's a small portion of it to the northwest. Right, Kim? Yeah. And we're talking, I'm looking at this right here. Am I right? Yeah. Up here. So here's the, this is the 100 foot, right? Yeah. Yep. So this so is the, the easement. Yeah. yeah. So there's a small portion of the easement that is in our jurisdiction. A very small portion of the butts. Where is that? Uh, your property, sir. Yeah, where's that? Why are we talking about that? It's a sewer, isn't it? What is this? Who's here? This guy. He's yeah. yeah. Is that, is that what we're referring to? I think that's to? what I was referring to. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. Um, right. Yeah, this, so that easement, the sewer easement, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that's out of our jurisdiction. So we have, uh, you know, the commission really has no say in what's done with that. But you're certainly welcome to ask. Sure. I mean, I think the the intent for maintenance of the sewer would be that there wouldn't be roots. That would just come on encourage into the potential yeah. sewer line. So I think the DBW who would inherit the sewer line would ask that there was no root system there. Uh, I think that we can specifically look at trees there. I'm happy to meet out there with you to, to look at them before we do the work and, and talk about what would happen with any particular tree um, or the run in general. But I think the general sentiment from the ultimate owner of it would be we don't want root systems growing into our sewer plant. Okay. So how do you prevent that from happening once the sewer pipe is in and put a lot of the area is forested? Oh, yeah. I mean I think they would maintain the easement such that no new growth grows up there. But I don't think they're not going to go underground to continue to maintain root systems. So if they grew out from where they are there, I don't know that there's anything to be done about that. Uh, getting a little bit out of my depth here, but uh, you know, I, I think in general they're trying to prevent infiltration into the sewer line. So I'm sorry. One one more question. Um, to get a 30-foot backyard behind the back corner of that house, are you clearing all the way up to my property line, or are there going to be any trees bordering that yard that are owned by the new owners? So as it's proposed right now, there is clearing up to the property line on, call it half halfway down the property line, and I'm making that number up but it, it's about that um, at which point we branch off and leave a tree bubble. but as so this is kind of the limit of work that he's referring to so it would be cleared here along this line so there'd be some left in this area and back in here 
So, I'm sorry. So if he's clearing right, and I don't know the rules or regs on this, if he's clearing right to my property line, I'm assuming he has to leave like a 10-foot buffer or something from the property line. He can't just cut. If I have a tree here, he can't just take a backhoe right next to my tree, can he? All the way down the line, and all my trees die that are right there? If the trees on their property, they can cut it down. No, if You're worried about the one, roots. One, yeah, right. Root damage. One foot right. on my property, they can dig right here. There's no like need for no, a right to protect the ten root. foot buffer or anything like that. I'd, I'd be happy to meet with you and, and look at that claim on the line before we cut down the tree. Okay. I didn't know if there was any interest. It's surprising to me that there's not any regulations around it. Yeah, I mean, if there are, I'm not sure if it's the purview of this okay. commission, though. Uh, yes, sir. All right, Steve Montgomery, 13th Larry Lane, Alex's neighbor. Mm -hmm. So, are you familiar with the Sunshine Act? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure so, that the sewer line that we're talking about does run down your the back of your property line, too. Right. So, I mean, that would need to be cleared. In order to install the sewer line, swap, it would be the entire property, or is that um, we don't have great clearing limits shown on here. Um, I don't see grading um, in all of that area. I don't. I mean, our goal in general is to leave up as many trees as possible. I mean, we're we're not looking to clear cut everything. Right. Um, so, yeah. so yes, we would need a clear swap for the sewer. Judging by what I see here, which isn't a perfect picture, I think there would be uh, a grouping of trees left between that sewer line and um, and the road. The yard. Yeah, in, in the side yard. Okay. Um, easements in general of sewer lines that, that's outside the purview of this commission? Well, if it's in a resource area, it falls under our purview, but in this case, the easement is outside of any resource so area. I ask there's another easement through um, the middle of our properties for a sewer that has been under discussion in terms of its scope uh, with the previous owner. So is that something we talk to you, or whose jurisdictions are uh, sewer easements through properties? Oh, yeah, DPW. DPW. Is there a line there now? It looks like a, it's a private There's a paper line. There's a lot of There's no line. 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 I don't think it's an easement. It's between the two private property. I think it's owned by the town. Um, if you look at the lines in the book, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean. I'm not sure, but I don't see it on the other box. Yeah, because there's a first. I mean, that's, that's the same line as we were talking to Mr. Scott about, correct? This one comes from the rear of four little labs, so it's all very nice. Yeah, it, it, yep. that's the same one we're, we, we're talking about with Mr. Scott. And I, again, I'd be happy to look at it with you. Okay. Um, with you both and, and look at what clearing would be required and what we could try to see. Okay. Uh, one final question. How we tossed around uh, square footage? What the uh, current uh, building size is. Mine, mine says 88 and 89. That, that, that's, that's correct. correct. The current one? Yeah. That's a pretty small house. Trying to get concom permits. That's too small. Yes. Just uh, for the benefit of the of the abutters here, the zoning advisory committee under planning is considering. Uh, drafting a tree protection bylaw for for the town and working on that um, it may go to town meeting so I would encourage you to get involved with the zoning advisory committee if you're interested and at the very least um, show up to town meeting if it comes up at town meeting and express support and vote for it just wanted to add that thank you what do they decide on still still being drafted still in the works but um, it's I would, I would bump into Ted to talk about the specifics, but it's a um, bylaw to add regulation to, to tree removal in town. To protect trees mm -hmm. from excavation, 
to protect roots, uh, the root zone from like it's, just it's being drafted, Jim. It's it's in discussions, and everybody is welcome to come to the discussions. <laughs> so, okay. Any other questions from the audience? All right. So we'll continue these out to our next meeting, which is September 12th. I get a motion uh, to that effect for all three. Um, notices of intent for Toll Brothers. So moved. And the second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. That'll be okay. a remote meeting, correct? That's correct, yes. Can I ask why we're remote versus in person? We just, really we've happen. been doing it remote and we just figured, you know, occasionally it makes sense to get together as a commission in person. Um, Let's go come down with COVID in which case we'll just go <laughs> lock ourselves up again. Uh, this was a mistake. <laughs> every other For meeting, or no, is it just no, periodically. It's, yeah, it's periodically. Uh, once every few months. It, like, my my straight my straight yeah, the Okay, uh, the trails, zero Wilson Street. This is a violation discussion. That looks good. I'm trying to answer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah, we're not against. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Gately. Good evening. Got the branches. Okay. Um, you heading out? So? Yeah, I'm right. right. Thank you. Have a good evening. Well, we have good news to report that at the last rain event, uh, we didn't have any breaches or violations um, with phase four. So. Um, I want to commend you get folks on that. Um, the one previous to that, too, yeah. we didn't have a release in two now. Four. Yeah. So two, two rain events. And Good. I can just share. I would disagree with that, but we can just have. Yeah. All right. Phase four, I, I, we, we, we documented that we didn't have a release, so yep. we, we can talk to Kim about what she found. Um, but we we're in good shape. I mean, the, the, right now the road is, is uh, three inch minus uh, crushed stone um, from its length. So all the way around. Um, so all surface areas within the road. We've got a drainage channel that runs along our edges. We've got a new basin that we just started. Um, we've got two cells with it right now because the front cell still has uh, water in it. We've pumped it. Um, looks like we're going to get a week of dry weather, which would be wonderful. Um, so we're going to be able to pump both basins down and, and then remove the sediment. Um, because our infiltrative basin also, also has been marginalized because its bottom is full of sediment. Okay. So we're going to get the sediment out of here, we're going to get the sediment out of the, the lower basin, and in the coming week, um, we'll get back to building a road, um, because ultimately that's what we need to do is get all these drain lines connected. And, the lowest utility is the sewer. Um, so that's really what has to start happening is get the sewer line in so we can get the drain lines in. So which basin numbers are these? Yep, so, so three is the main basin. So that's built um, that's this and one? stabilized. Uh, actually, it's in the, 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 this picture shows it's because it's, it's in the background. Okay. And that's 100% that's, well, that's stabilized, but I would say it's probably like 80%. We've got grass growth over its entire surface. It's uh, on these steeper embankments. It's not lush, but uh, along its top surface. And uh, this is basin one is, right here. Uh, this is a temporary, temporary basin. basin one right there. That's yeah. that. Yes. Okay. And then we've got another one that's here. We surveyed that in um, today. Uh, we don't have that on that exhibit. It's just it's in, we have the data points, but we don't have it on the exhibit. But that's located here. Um, and then we've got a channel that goes up through here that we also have done through survey. Okay, and then which one is this? Is this so this, look, this is looking up the road now. So, so looking back to the homes. So, so that would be this view. So I'd be standing here and looking back up the road to give you a, a perspective coming back to um, Walnut which is the road that connects to Waterville. Okay, so this is just an area that's been loaned. Correct. In other words, this we, isn't a basin. No, no, no. Okay, got it. No, so, so, so all surface areas um, either have the, the, the stone 
that we use stump grindings on some of the slopes that still have to be um, worked. If it's, if it's a work area, it's, it's likely to have some grindings on it. So area that we're going to be leaving for a longer period of time, it's got you know, a uh, hydro seed. Um, we now have the Flex Terra product, which is a bonded fiber mix. So that everything that got hydro seeded today actually has that in it. We were not able to purchase that. It's been unavailable in New England for about 60 days. Okay. Um, so that supply uh, came in. We have it. And anytime we do more hydro seeding, we'll be using that. Okay. So that's phase four. Um, in phase three, uh, we did have a, a problem with our basin that we created at the toe of the Wilson Street uh, area. That basin, um, during what I call flash events, uh, we had that one inch in one hour, was overwhelmed. Um, there was a lot, three lots that, that uh, had been loamed, but they did not have uh, saw it on them yet, those washed into that basin. That basin then overflowed and, and went out on Wilson Street. Um, that basin is marginalized now because of all the silt that came into it. Um, so we are going to um, hopefully with tomorrow, tomorrow, tonight's rain, tomorrow, uh, Thursday, go back into that and we're going to remove all of the silt and, and redo that. Do you have a picture of that, Kim? That basin, this one? Uh, yes, that's it. So that basin is, is uh, drain is uh, is low back down to just a, a powder of um, talc, if you will, <laughs> of, of silt. Um, yeah. So that every time that, that it gets wetted again, that just goes into suspension. Mm -hmm. So we need to get that out of there. Um, so the contract is going to go in. We we're hoping we can do it in two days um, for the Monday holiday. At least the, what I'm seeing to, for next week to next Thursday looked like it was going to be clear weather. So we're going to be able to, we know we can finish it. So we'll put that back online again. And that does infiltrate. Um, it, it, it has worked, but it's not going to infiltrate now, not, not effectively. So what's the plan for cleaning that out? How are they going to accomplish we're gonna that? We're going to take, take dredge it right out. So completely remove it and um, replace all of the trap rock. So the water that's in there, will that be pumped out? There's no water in it now. Oh, so okay, if we don't get right. a lot of rain tonight with this rain, we get some water in there, I'll have it pumped out. If I have to pump it into a tank, yeah, no, if I had to, I'd use a vac truck. I, there's nowhere to pump it to. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kim, did you want to? Uh, so we've, we've used vac trucks for this project a number of times already. So. Okay. okay. Yeah. I have, he's on speed dial. <laughs> if I would just buy a truck. Uh, well, they're expensive. <laughs> you want to pass these down? So? Yeah, just go with these guys. Uh, I was before the Ashland Conservation Commission last night as well. So, yeah, we have a discussion with them. So very, very brief summary. Obviously, I can I can answer more questions as they come up. Um, just want to point out that Afeka from Ashton Concom is here in the audience as well if um, she wants to make comments or you have questions for her. Um, so basically, I documented violations, um, turbid, visibly turbid, sediment-laden laden water coming off of the site on um, specifically phase four, which is kind of the new area um, that's been opened up on July 10th, July 17th, on August 8th. On August 18th, I also, well, on August 8th and August 18th, I also documented um, turbid water coming off of the first phase of the project from that basin that we were just discussing, the infiltration swale that was created behind Wilson Street. Um, so multiple violations were issued. Um, I was in contact with Mr. Bemis on several occasions. Um, we've had, you know, I don't even know how many emails and phone calls and whatnot. So communication between um, the 10th and the 18th was frequent and often. Um, and so that's where we're at. Um, the last time we met and talked uh, to Mr. Bemis, Mr. Bemis and Mr. Gately, the commission asked me to do a fine memo, um, but on that day, it was August 8th, that was the day that an additional violation occurred, so I had to edit the um, fine. So I took um, the time between July 10th and August 18th, which is the last point which I documented uh, violation, which was coming from the first phase of the project, and I tallied that up per violation of the order of conditions violated times the number of days that they're in violation, which from July 10th to August 18th would be 39 days, and um, $300 per violation. So the tally comes up to 
dollars. $141,600. And I'm happy to answer any questions or have any, you know, discussion. Um, that being said, you know, Mr. Bemis is correct. The stormwater infiltration basin on phase four was constructed during that point and is functioning well. Um, additional stormwater BMPs have been put in place. There's another temporary detention area. There's a trench um, that conveys stormwater from the top of the site where there's a roughed in road to the bottom of the site. Um, I did issue a cease and desist. I believe after the July event, the second July event. And um, what I'm requesting at this point is that the entirety of phase four be stabilized and that the stormwater BMPs that were put in place supporting calculations be submitted to show that they were uh, sized to reflect the, the size and the current site cover conditions at, at the site. Um, I also spoke to Mr. Bemis after last Friday's storm on the 25th, um, as he mentioned, the, the three lots that were submitting sedimentation into the infiltration basin behind Wilson Street were sodded, which eliminated the, the problem from, from that perspective, from those three lots. I noticed that the water was still turbid though, so I followed it all the way upstream. At the very top of the site, it's actually a location of a future proposed dog park. It's the very top of the site is, um, open and is being used to, to um, process mold um, and sedimentation from that portion of the site is actually making its way all the way down through the systems to that lower infiltration area. So last Friday it wasn't such that the infiltration area overtops to the reservoir um, but it was another I think that was another contributing item that you and I had, had talked about that needed uh, mitigation so the cease and desist is ongoing we have another site inspection scheduled for Thursday so that I can see the the upgrades on, on phase four and make a determination as to whether or not that cease and desist can be lifted um, I don't know currently Ashlyn may also have their own kind of regulatory holds um, at this point on the project as well. What's the status on the calculations that Kim is requesting of those? Yeah, we, that's what we did the survey work today was so we could document all of that because we, we were literally building it today. Okay. Uh, so unfortunately it's, you know, well, they were 24 already, hours. They were already built, right? We, we, built, we built more though. That's okay. what I'm saying to you is that, that okay. we were trying to get all of everything done so all the field work is completed now and the calculations will be done tomorrow. And I'll have them for you Thursday morning, as I said. All right. So up to the chair for uh, yes. um, Kim. Uh, so something I found a little troubling that I read in the memo from Ashlyn, and I just wanted to make sure I understand it correctly. When you both were in the field, you had recommended some improvements to the access road, and it was decided not to do it based on cost, and then that caused a violation in the next storm event because the access road washed away. Did I, am I understanding that correctly? One of the recommendations that I made was that the um, cul-de-sac roadway that was already established be stabilized with stone. Um, and Mr. Bemis, I don't remember if it was Mr. Bemis or Mr. Gately, basically said that they didn't want to elect to do that at that time. Um, and we did have a, a subsequent violation after that, I believe. I can't say whether it was directly because the road wasn't stone, but certainly if there was greater site stabilization, that would have helped. Thank you. I, I, I do want to clarify that it wasn't totally ignored. What, what we did do is we put a channel around the entire edge of the road that was stoned. So the, 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 the issue was, was the entire surface stoned? No. But we did, we did create a channel around the entire perimeter of the area. Just proven to stone adequate. And it's stoned now. And it's some amount of road. Stone. Yeah, to, to, yeah, totally stoned now. But it's a, at the time, it, if I may add yeah. to that, yeah. I feel like the BMP measures are being implemented, but they're not commensurate with the scope of the project. Um, and then they continue to be or, overwhelmed. Or after there's a violation rather than before. Right. And, you know, as with the BMPs that were just put in, they're not designed ahead of time to, you know, no calculations are put in to be able to definitively say this BMP will hold the volume necessary. 
and detain it for the necessary amount of time before it's actually constructed. I mean, obviously that takes some time, so that results in some delay, um, but certainly we need to find a balance between making sure that our BMPs are adequately sized versus, you know, just doing it and hoping yeah. it works. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the basin is sized for the entire project at full build out. So, and right now we're using the basin to hold all of the water on site. So, we actually had zero discharges to hit the PL that was plugged. Um, what happened in the August 8th storm, and I gave you a video of that, was that the water was coming in through the pipe or into the other. Because all the control structure was there to hold the water. But the water was coming in and coming into the back of the pipe. They had lost all their jointing. And that's that's installation. Um, I don't know if you saw the picture, Kim, but was, we had shared it at one point. Um, so it was a failure of the contractors' construction construction technique uh, that's been since corrected. Um, so each of the storms that have happened subsequent to that, we've held the water. And in, in the first storm back in July, we didn't have a base. They were trying to build the basin at the time of that storm. So that's that's the other failure at that point was that they're trying to build something and it hasn't had to stop raining. So who's supervising the contractors at the site? Um, it, it, pr prior to this, um, it, I've been out, we've been surveying and we've been giving them plans, but there's there's been not sufficient su supervision. Mr. Gailey did assign that to um, yes, I have a have Kevin a, Crowley. Right, my contractor, job superintendent. Uh, he's been with me for 30 years. He's an architect and as well um, he's basically next door where we're building out units but he's on site on phase four several times a day as needed okay. uh, i think peter pretty much starts his day off at phase four um, i live about a four mile walk from phase four i'm in actually phase one of the trails but there's a walking trail that connects the first three phases to the fourth phase. I walk down there every morning, um, meet Kevin, and then as things come up during the day, Kevin and Peter, you know, connect, and that's how we've been managing it. Um, the 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 last three system weeks. going forward. Yeah, I, yeah. I have to say that this it's, it's a lot more proactive and a lot more uh, pushback. But I would say that there, there are some things that we've noticed with these storms because of the flash nature of them, the intensity is, is excessive. Um, and I don't know, Kim, you, you walked the area with Zach, and, and I don't know, again, if you didn't go all the way up to Legacy Farm and even onto the south side of Legacy Farm, the water that's coming down is actually causing turbulence within the natural channel. And we're, we're, we're turbid before you even get to North Legacy Farm Road. So in other words, south of that, coming on to, on, coming underneath, it's already turbid water condition. If you want to take a sample of it versus its background. So by the time it gets down to us, you see that channel, it's, it's looking pretty badly. It, it, and what I wanted to suggest was there's a trail that comes from, that connects it, connects phases one, two, and three to four. Um, and that's a land bridge. That, that land bridge likely should be removed because of what happens is every storm that has any significant intensity is going over that culvert. This culvert was just put in by the landscape company and they were doing the work here. It's, uh, it's proving to be a, a constricted point and you're getting, you're getting that condition. These are all um, since our last meeting? That would have been the August 18th storm. That one inch, yeah. that one inch and one hour overwhelmed that culvert. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we had no water release from phase four. It, our pond held all of the water. This is this is the background water coming through the project. Um, so that's the water we're coming onto your project. Com coming through the, in other words, coming through all of the channels well, from North Legacy right. Farm, coming through from the, the natural source. channel. Ah, yes. I, and I agree with you. The um, the basin, the main infiltration basin, does a good job holding. I think the main issue on the eighth was that the the storm water from the top half of the site didn't make it to the basin, and that's what you're seeing here is the bridge point. So it was really that the temporary BMPs weren't in place to be able to, di to direct it to that basin. We had the swirling by then. It, 
to bring the water down to the town. This is the, 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 this is the, 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 the this is, this is, all right, I'm, I'm mixing up my storm. Okay. okay right, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's the, that's the, right. That's the one when they were, the water was coming off the side. I don't disagree with that. It went underneath the erosion control barrier. Yes, that overwhelmed that edge. I don't disagree with that. So I think, um, you know, the land bridge, the land that bridge you're needs about. to be re, re, just evaluated from the commission's perspective. It would be an activity in your buffer zone. Yes, so that's, we could that's remove right. it to make a, some other kind of bridge. So it's in our jurisdiction. I think it's incumbent on you guys to look at it from an engineering standpoint. Yeah, okay. And um, you know, come up with a design that is going to work mm -hmm. for the removal however appropriate that is okay. um, and then it would need to be a project change uh, I think Greg Kim depending on what the extent of the work is but I think to Kim's point you know we can't be putting band-aid type um, fixes in and then doing the calculations after they're already, you know, kind of backing into the calculations. Understood. So, you know, um, yeah, I just, the site looked good this past storm, um, this weekend, you know, Melissa was out there, I, I stopped out there, uh, so that was very promising, uh, but we just want to make sure that we keep up, yeah. Agreed, yeah. Yeah. keep up with this, and, uh, you know, that we don't, See the issues continuing going forward. Yeah. Chair, I suggest rather than keep up, we keep ahead. <laughs> no, no disagreement. Question? Yes. So you're seeing substantial or significant or both impacts from off gradient or upgraded offsite stormwater. Onto your project. Just, just within the watershed, just if you look at the turbulence within the natural stream channel, it, it, it's just. Yeah. Well, my, my, my question is <laughs> my question is going to be is there something lacking upgraded upstream of this site for stormwater control that wasn't done or should be done now? I mean, if you're getting you know, all that water down and all the rest of the property, the offsite property, the upgrading has been developed, right? So, you know, all this water is coming onto their site because it's uncontrolled on the other development site? It's just these natural streams um, haven't had this type of frequency of rainfall. No, I, and, I know. And the saturation levels, and what I'm just saying is that that natural stream is, is under stress as well. I guess it's, we, there's, there's, there's the stress that we, we're putting on the land. And we have mitigation for that, yeah. be it adequate or not adequate. But but I'm saying to you, aside from what we are doing on our land, if, the, if you look at the natural forested area and what's rushed, the water that's coming through it, with these cycles of rain okay. events that okay. we've had, it is causing turbulence in that channel so that it's actually s transporting sediment within the channel itself. The, the okay. natural mods are actually physically moving and transporting right. in the channel. So it's not, uh, yeah, Before I know gets to us. In, the, in the inundation, I know it's like these little fingers in the woods and they're coming out, but there's not, an upgrading basin is not going to help. No. I, don't, I don't think it's originating from development. Okay. Uh, that was, that's upstream, my question. That's per se, I think it's just, you know, the soils at the site are poorly yep. draining right. in the first place. Then they're super saturated secondarily. Yeah, right. Then we're getting right. weekly storms. So, right. I mean, it's just going over the, you know, it's not infiltrating at all. It's just all overland flow. Yeah. Right. So yeah, when you I start taking right. a turbidity analysis, it's just, you're like, wow, this is my background. It's, it's you know, over 50. I mean, in some sections. I don't know, when you were with Zach, you said you saw 30s, but I know he had said so he had some as high as 50s. And the natural stream channel, that's nothing to do with construction water. That's, that's excessive. I, I think we've I think we've seen though like I mean you can tell what's coming off of a natural you know forested area and what goes through a site and picks up sediment mm -hmm. from a construction okay. site. I mean I have pictures. It's the yellows in there. versus the browns, absolutely. It, it, but I'm just yeah. saying to you when you put so, it still put it in a vial and you put it in the turbidity meter. I'm just saying to you that you Yeah, but I mean just you can tell you can tell what is coming from the site mm -hmm. and what is just 
you know, background. Okay. It's Channel erosion. Right. So Coming regardless on. of what's going on around, you know. I just want to try to eliminate that one constriction. That's all I'm saying is that that trail right there is a point, a, a constricted point, and we're, we're putting that water over the surface, and it's just going to transport more sediment if we don't do something about it. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back with a proposal for you on that. I want to please broach it. And I think I've been fair in making sure that I'm not issuing violations on something that's like NTU 50. It's like NTU 200. You know what I mean? Where I can feel uh, like I, I it's, I'm confident that it's... I didn't that say it's, anything other than I that. Just, I just want to be, you know, I'm good. arbitrating fairly. The, the most disappointing one was the Wilson Street Basin because it's been a very effective um, device that didn't exist and, and, um, and then you know, it's disappointing that it's it, it, can't, it doesn't function right now. So we have to go re redo it. Jeff, may I ask a super easy question, I think? Yeah. Kim, do we have access to the um, violations letter, fines letter that you put on the screen? I can't find it. Yeah, it's the file is insane. Let me, let me see if I can. Oh, it's in the packet, but not on the last one. Okay. So Kim's looking for did you, that. Did you find it? Yeah. Well, if it's in the, I didn't it look in the, the packet. The I was packet, looking yeah. on the computer. It's the last thing. Okay. Uh, is there stabilization of that um, site where the um, loan operation yeah, there's, 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 there was three dikes, now there's uh, five, um, just to be sure, and we're trying to get that all done, wrap that up, and then do the dog park. So, so what's the time frame for that, approximately? It, literally the next 30 days, we should be out of there, complete with the dog so park. So that mound complete. will be gone? Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. It'll be Significantly gone then, now. And then the dog park will be, construction will be Correct. Yeah. yeah. And then get so that hydro seat. days? Yeah. And there's a trail that goes down to the parking lot there that could also be constructed. Right. Sorry, I have a lot to say. <laughs> you can't find the letter. Oh, the chair. Um, I, I have been spending a significant amount of time at, at this site. Um, Beta is inspecting on behalf of the planning board um, at certain construction milestones. So they're not there all the time. Um, the Order of Conditions empowers the Commission to hire professionals to assist in their, you know, administering of the order. I don't know if it's something that the Commission might want to consider hiring a third party SWIFT inspector just to give me another hand, somebody else on site to assist with the developer with, you know, inspection of erosion controls, make recommendations for maintenance or repair. and. Um, we do have additional land use consultants on staff at this point that I could, you know, see if they're available to provide that service. And that's paid for by the town? That would be paid for by the applicant. I, uh, I, could, I would be in support of that. Yeah, I, I think we need to relieve Kim of some... I'm yeah, on this I to pay attention to other projects too, and I think it's something that I would consider doing it potentially in in lieu of part of the fine. Um, May I ask a question? Then, yeah. The fines that were levied and weren't paid for a couple of years, have those been paid? Yes. So those are all settled? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question that Melissa did. Can we, I know we can't put use the forth. fine to, for, you know, allocate some of the fine towards the... We can't literally. We could take that into consideration and reduce the fines. Oh. To, to me, it's two separate issues. This is a fine because of prior violations. It's hiring a, a, a consultant yeah. to prevent future violations. I don't think the taxpayers should take this burden of like people in the in town hall and you having to deal with it. All the well, time. there's no taxpayer burden. Well, we're paying that, you know. It is because it's taking it's Kim's taking, time. It's, yeah, it's, it's taking, it's taking out Kim's time. time and it's, it is slowing thing. down other permit applications for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm in support of that, Kim. Do we want to get a proposal? Yeah. Um, so we can run that by Mr. Gately. And then um, are we getting the SWIPs every couple weeks is where it's supposed to be? 
we are getting some slips. Some. This yeah. I think we're getting next week. Yeah, I think we're getting Peter, if you could copy me on them. Sure. Substantial compliance. Yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. We can do that. Yeah. Um, okay. I guess the question is what do we want to do with the fines? Um. Uh, I, can I say, I mean, I, I get it. I get the, um, I get the math, I get the regulations and stuff, but considering the weather that we've had and other factors here that seems to me contribute to this, I, I don't know. I mean, I think those fines are maybe a little bit high. Uh, so I understand the math, but. I'm not sure what other factors you're referring to. I think that the upgrading, I mean, I, you know, background is not, well, I think the upgrading water has had an effect. And that's under the control of someone else. I mean, I've had projects like this where we were inundated with water, came from an adjacent property. So, but it's a stream. It, it doesn't flow through the, through the construction portion of their site. It doesn't just flow the over land their with site, it, it just grows. they're dealing with it. Well, one of the things it that goes right through okay. and down right. to the reservoir. <laughs> so right. one, one of the things that you look at when you do SWIP plans and SWIP inspections is putting things into place to divert water from coming onto your site to prevent that water from right. picking up what's on the site. So I think that's one of the steps when you're phasing and putting together your, your SWIP plan that you, as a contractor, are responsible for. You can protect your own site from that water and take measures to avoid that being your problem. And, and, and am I correct in assuming that part, the, the I guess the level of the, of the violations were intensified because phase four was cleared and it wasn't supposed to be? They were specifically instructed not to clear all of it, and it was all cleared again. So to answer your question from my point of view, Jeff, yes, I, um, with this project or these different sections of project, I am done myself being, holding anything in advance. I think that we have been patient. We have tried to work with the developer. We have waited two years for the last round of fines to be paid, and I don't see any reason to hesitate leveling fines that they've earned through poor practices. I think that if we do do a hiring, that's about making sure nothing happens in the future. These fines are about continued mistakes of the past, and those are two separate issues. Okay. That's me. Agreed. All right. Well, um, does someone want to entertain a motion? Can I just say one thing? Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Okay. Um, I, we just saw these this afternoon, um, and I know it's a math exercise. Um, <clears throat> to be honest with you, I think the nature of this board, and I understand it's zero tolerance, so there are no excuses. Mother Nature is not an excuse, but I, I think this is very punitive, and um, I'd like a chance to at least read through that yep. and, and and weigh in. I, I'm not sure if you're talking about a motion to um, approve these, but um, I, I would like, given the fact we just saw it, Actually, I just saw it on my phone. Yep, that's fair. A few minutes ago. Okay. Um, but I think we could we can give a laundry list of of reasons why things have happened, and I'm not sure that means much to this commission. But I'd like the chance to to do that. That's a big amount. Um, 
we have gone two years without any violations. Granted, the weather cooperated last summer. It's hard to believe we've gone from two years ago was the wettest July and August on record to last year being the driest and the hottest on record. And now we're back to kind of a conditions of 21. Um, anyways, it's, it, it, this has not been an easy project. Um, we have done so many things on the fly. I mean, had we built the plan that the town approved, we would have, believe me, we would, we would have had some major problems. I think we've reacted and try to be as proactive as we can and we've peter has done i mean if you look at all of the drainage improvements that we've made they're all bigger much more expensive and, and my, i don't even want to talk about the expense part because i get it that's that shouldn't be a, a factor but um we yeah. have we have done just a, so many improvements i think um that had to be done that we recognized in the field were not working as designed and um, I just don't think at the end of the day we get a lot of credit for that. We just seem to get um, you know, the, the negative part of, of, of the whole issue. Um, so anyways, just to. No, that's fair enough. You know, we'll give you an opportunity to go through the, the memo that Ken put together. Um, and to you know kind of put your thoughts together so you can present you know a, a, um, you know your position um, you know it's I mean I don't want to drag this conversation on but I mean the phase three portion you know we're still having issues with that we shouldn't be at this point you know the runoff from the three sites that ended up in the basin i mean that's just that shouldn't happen i mean really that's not a very significant issue it's housekeeping in my mind really uh, but that's neither here nor there so um we'll continue this out to through the chair uh, yes i just wasn't sure if becca wanted to make a comment becca do you have any comments um, uh, we, uh, i think kim's covered most of it i think the only thing that So I mean, like stuff like that, Mr. Bemis should not be happening. I can disagree. I said that when I saw that, but you know, um, but it continues Contract. to happen. Okay. Um, so is everyone okay if we continue this out? Uh, so Mr. Gately has an opportunity to review the memo. Okay. So if I can get a motion to continue this uh, violation discussion out to September 12th for the trails. I uh, will make the motion. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Kim. Um, Mr. Petrosi's not here, so can we push Wall Street Development to the next hearing? I did get an email from him. He stated he is watching on HKM and that he didn't realize that the meeting tonight wasn't on Zoom. He said, can I request a continuance? Okay. So can I get a motion to continue the uh, Wall Street Development violation discussion out to September 12th, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Okay, any public forum requests? None. All right, motion to adjourn. It's late. He huh? said I have a couple of things, but it's late, and it's mostly about um, one, I was wow. assigned to be the invasive control guy, and I've done some work on that. Okay. I have also been uh, challenged along with. Julia Chan to do this work on the stormwater planning, and we've done work on that. And what I can do um, is I can do some of this with Kim. There you go. If we, Ed, if you don't mind, I think our agenda for September 12th right now is pretty light, correct? A little light. 
lighter. Sounds fine. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, motion to adjourn. Right. So moved. Second. All favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Are we supposed to be out of here by 10? Quick announcement that we've selected the October 24th.